Hello, good evening, welcome everybody to this, the final episode for now, at least, of English Restoration. And today, we are probably reaching the point that this has all been drawing towards. We've been looking at various figures, various historical episodes and legendary characters from throughout England and let's just say Britain's history more generally. But you could not do a series on this without addressing the character, the man, the myth, the legend, who's at very much the heart of our social and cultural life. It's King Arthur himself, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table. Before I introduce my wonderful guest, I wanted to play a video which comes from quite recently. Uh, it's from the royal coronation of Charles, uh, whose middle name, of course, is Arthur. And there's a there's a there was a little moment in it that really moved me. It was it was quite powerful, and I think for me it expresses much of what the the person of King Arthur uh, symbolizes for for the English. So I'm going to play that, and uh, hopefully it will put us in the mood and the give us the feel of Arthur as we go into this conversation. Receive this kingly sword. May it be to you and to all who witness these things a sign and symbol not of judgment, but of justice, not of might, but of mercy. With this sword, do justice. Stop the growth of iniquity. Protect the Holy Church of God and all people of goodwill. Help and defend widows and orphans. Restore the things that are gone to decay. Maintain the things that are restored. Punish and reform what is amiss and confirm what is in good order. That doing these things, you may be glorious in all virtue and so faithfully serve our Lord Jesus Christ in this life, that you may reign forever with him in the life which is to come. Amen. So, joining me to discuss King Arthur, the return of King Arthur in particular, I have, as ever on English Restoration, Rupert August. Hello, Rupert. How are you doing? Hello, I'm doing very well. Very uh, excited to finally get to the, uh, I suppose, the climax of this whole series. <laughs> well, and I should say as well, you know, I've, I've mentioned this a few times before that actually you gave a speech really talking about Arthurian restoration at last year's Witten. And that was the inspiration behind this whole uh, series. So in many ways, it's, it, it's kind of circled back round from even that. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, even I've learned more since then, though. So, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's a, a very worthy idea, and I'm glad we, that we've managed to expand it so much more and uh, and so worthily, perhaps. Yes, and I think that many of the streams that we've been wading in throughout this year are going to come together in this episode too. And joining us, you know, starting, uh, she joined us at the beginning, and she's been a. Uh, presence throughout English restoration. It seems quite fitting that we're joined by Daughter of Albion. Hello, DOA. How are you doing? Hi, evening, guys. Thank you for having me. It's nice to be back again. I'm very sad to learn that there's going to be a hiatus, though, but um, hoping it's just temporary. <laughs> oh, well, you know, Arthur is asleep on Avalon or under the mountains and he returns, right? So there's always, there's always one day. Having a slumber. <laughs> How are you doing, though? How, how I'm really good. Been? I'm not too bad, actually. Just been uh, doing a little travel to America, believe it or not. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a bit of a struggle to be back in the rainy weather here, but uh, <laughs> at least fitting for the, the mood of the conversation, for sure. <laughs> I mean, it, it gives you a proper sense of being back home, I guess. The, the... It does. I actually really quite like the rainy weather. I, I pretend to complain, but I, it feels like home. <laughs> well, exactly. And 
I mean, one of, one of the things we spoke about on a, a previous stream is that, um, let me see, uh, hopefully that's a bit better with audio, um, is that the, you know, the English climate is conducive to this idea of the garden and a land of growing things, but that can be uh, cultured and shaped. And I think in a way, um, although Arthur himself is not a, strictly speaking, a gardener, that idea of order, bringing order to the wilds is very much bound up in our kind of culture. So to me, the mild rain, the, the drizzly atmosphere is just so integral to it. everything English in some ways. <laughs> well, even even just the image of the Arthurian castle in, in the kind of rain slaked turrets and kind of crumbling ruins mm. and... Um, you know, the, the the misty morning of Camelot in the distance. Yeah, absolutely. I can't imagine it in any other terrain. No, no, not at all. Um, so so before we get into it, um, Daughter of Albion, is there anything you would like to promote? No, I'm afraid of, I'm going through a bit of a drought on the content front at the moment. I um, A few things have come up in real life, but I, I, I know I keep saying I'll be making videos. I'm afraid just a little bit of a hiatus myself as well, but I do plan to return when all is squared away. So I guess it's a watch this space kind of moment, I'm sorry to say. Oh, well, we'll, <laughs> we'll all just be waiting in anticipation. So <laughs> I will just build that. up. You know when they like release, um, you know, for a film, they release the trailer like months uh, ago. No, no pressure then. Yeah, no pressure at all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what about Rupert? Do you do you have anything to promote? Um, usual usual writing. So uh, I've had a uh, an art article published in the Dissident Review, Volume Two. Um, so you can go and have a look at that. Uh, and I'm also I've also had an article published recently, uh, the Not So Yellow Peril on Praxaki. Mm. Um, but probably the, the more headline thing is that I am myself also planning to uh, come back to YouTube in the very near future. I'm sort of in the, in the process of, of putting something together to come back. So hopefully that will be quite soon. Oh, Ooh. fantastic. Uh, any any um, teasers for what it might be about? Uh, it will be looking uh, very specifically for the moment at uh, Monarchy and just unpacking it in more detail than you've, ever, than you've ever possibly thought to give it. That sounds great. Awesome. That sounds good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, everybody should go and watch that when it comes out. Um, and that will be, you know, taking up the mantle further. So with that in mind, let's come to Arthur himself. Uh, and I, I should say as well um, that we're going to probably chat about Arthur for a, a couple of hours. And then uh, as a kind of bonus, because it's the final stream, there's going to be time for a question and answer. And that could be on anything. It could be about Arthur. It could be about myth and legend. It could be about anything you want to ask. Can't promise you'll get a good answer, but you'll get an answer. So, uh, yes, uh, st stick around for that at the end as well. Um, but I, I guess before we get into the nitty gritty, I wanted to kind of ask um, Rupert and Daughter of Alpion, what for you is conjured up by the idea of Arthur's return? Uh, and I, I ask this in part um, because when I was kind of doing research for this. I, I'm mainly conversant with the like uh, art around Arthur, the, the myths themselves I've had to do a lot of reading up on. And there's a lot of um, depictions of the stories to do with King Arthur, more so his knights actually. Mm. But the actual idea of the return of Arthur, I couldn't find a single uh, painting of, uh, of course there's kind of fan art and things, but actual like pre-Raphaelite art didn't touch the return of Arthur, strictly speaking. So I, I'm kind of curious to 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 hear what you what's conjured for you both uh, by this idea. Should should I start? Um well I, just as you said Nathan, I actually I'm a big fan of uh, Tennyson and so the Arthurian legend is something I, I am often ruminating on in but as you say the focus is very much on the legacy of the knights and and the the tales of of bravery and daring but the question of arthur's return i'm ashamed to say maybe it was one of the first times i've actually stopped and thought i actually am not as familiar with that and for such an enduring legend a big part of our mythology as we'll, we'll probably discuss um it seems to be one of the more neglected uh, uh 
even though very salient and powerful uh, myths, it, it's quite neglected, I would say, because I, tr I did think, and I'm embarrassed to say, I suppose, that the only real iconic sense I have of the return of Arthur is with the with the Disney film, um, where I think it's, what is it just called, the legend, the sword in the stone, I should say. Uh, so the iconic image of the boy, I don't know if you ever watched the Disney, but the boy pulling the sword from the stone. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. I feel like this this is one of our myths that's somewhat neglected, which is which is the return, the idea of, I guess you might call it almost a kind of uh, messianic return. Not that it replaces the idea of Christ's return, but it's kind of bound up with it. Um, I guess the, the story of salvation, which I really can't think of a myth that would be more needed right now. I think it's probably a general thirst for the idea of the kind of the coming man or the return. Yeah, that's it. You've got the picture on the screen. Um, I actually probably think one of the less corrupt Disney films, if I say that, I shouldn't say that. Maybe there's some hidden messaging there, but that I remember. <laughs> but yeah, I suppose it is. And also from because I'm from uh, Cornwall in Devon, I know there's, there's a lake there that's supposedly meant to be associated with where Excalibur was handed to Arthur and, you know, in the lake by the Lady of the Lake. And that's the only real sense of the return of Arthur I had was from the image of him returning to be the righteous king of... Uh, of Britain by, and, and of course his task being to prove it with whether or not he can pull, retrieve the sword. Um, but yeah, I, 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 I'm looking forward to discussing more because I feel like it's one of those myths that we, we could do with dusting off a little bit and, and reviving. Yeah, so that's it really. Most definitely. And I, I think you're totally right that um, that film's a, a good presentation of the story, but again, it, it's very much like the early stage, isn't it? It's like how yeah. Arthur becomes king. But it's again, it's it's interesting too because it's not really about him being king either. So it's more about the initiation than what might come with the return. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good point. Mm -hmm. uh, Rupert. Yeah, the, the return itself is never actually explicitly laid out. It's it's sort of just hinted at here and there. But I think. Um, Looking back at the history of what the the return of Arthur kind of represents, uh, I, I think there's probably uh, a page to be taken out of uh, Scott Mannion's book, even though he's not here. I can uh, perhaps speak on his behalf when uh, when I say that there's something like a uh, a bit of Arthur that persists in all of us still, um, and so that sense in which Arthur returns is is a, like a return of Arthur in the uh, I don't know almost metaphysical sense, like a uh, a reinvigoration of the uh, the Anglo the Anglo spirit, uh, which which encourages us and pushes us on to sort of great deeds and to bring stability back back to the realm, not through the presence of an individual who, um, you know, withdraws his uh, withdraws the sword from the stone and uh, and sits atop a throne, but um, you know, a kind of um, recentering within ourselves that lets us to sort of uh, correctly orient our ourselves again and uh, and all be looking in the right direction. Do you think that's something with like that conception has be is carried through history, or do you see that as a um, like how we should engage with it as being separate from maybe like a twelfth century person? No, no. I think the the idea of the returned Arthur as an actual person is is, pr is probably the most the most key thing to having it um, actually have some impact. Uh, and so I'm not dis I'm not discounting this idea that uh, there can be a great uh, a great monarch who is um, who is going to be like the reembodiment of Arthur in some way, and I think that's that's quite a crucial part of the story at every at every stage where it's come to fruition. But it does almost seem as though uh, the th that a big part of the component is just the way that the stories are kind of um, imbued into the mindset and the the sort of spirit of the people who who really engage with it, and thereby they're they're able to resurrect the uh, the trueness of the story kind of within their own. Um, Within their own conceptions, basically, with their own, within their own mind, hmm. and then obviously parallel to that, you do, you do have uh, because the expectations are already are already all set there, and um, and because everybody is sort of like looking for an Arthur, and perhaps there's a there's a fruition of of some kind of character who looks like he could be an Arthur, and he's surrounded by knights who could be knights, you know, proper knights of the Round Table who are imbued with all of the correct uh, sensibilities and all the correct ethics. Then, in that sense, it is it is brought to fruition. But it was done so because everybody believed and, and because everybody expected and everybody has sort of accepted that in themselves prior to uh, prior to it arriving, perhaps. I think that's an excellent point. And in, in part, that's why I wanted to show that clip of the coronation, because whether, you know, 
whether or not uh, uh, Charles ever lives up to Arthur, and you know, I'm I'm skeptical, but we can hope. The obligations laid upon him, the gift of the sword, and what that brings with it. There was this sense of oh, this what's being asked of Charles is to step into the mantle of King Arthur in a way. It's like, go and wield, wield this sword for justice and mercy, defend the poor and the weak, uphold the holy church. These are all things I can picture Arthur doing. And so I see it, oh, when he's wearing those vestments and he's got that attached to his hip, he's being called to that, even though he himself is not literally Arthur. Yeah, exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But but within this framing, uh, perhaps the, the more pertinent question is, is not whether Charles will live up to the, the Arthurian uh, archetype or the, the Arthurian uh, legend that, that precedes him, but will we be ready to accept him um, as, a, as an Arthur figure if he, you know, are, are we ready, basically? Mm. Yes, that's a, that's a very good Carlylean kind of point. Uh, I remember him saying in on heroes and hero worship, or maybe it was past and present. It was like, even if you had... Uh, a great man return uh most of you would go and kill him uh anyway like you're not the sort of people that could produce or accept such a such an individual so it needs it needs that kind of community i guess um ready to receive such a figure or the the figures more broadly of arthur and his knights um but perhaps uh well one one thing i wanted to ask um is because a return well this is this is kind of an interesting idea because it it presupposes the the fall of arthur presupposes the tragedy within the arthurian story and it, there's different versions but essentially you can if you if you look through the literature there's there's kind of key moments of the fracturing of arthur and his his round table one is the discovery of lancelot and guinevere's affair so Lancelot being his greatest knight and Guinevere being the queen. And this leads to civil war between Arthur and Lancelot. And then in the vacuum, Arthur's nephew, Mordred, seizes a throne for himself. And it is in battle when Arthur slays Mordred, he himself is uh, fatally wounded. And there's different versions, but one is that he's taken to the Isle of Avalon, where he is tended to by uh, Morgana, uh, the Fae Enchantress, and waits, you know, to return to, to Britain when it is needed. So I wondered if um, either of you'd want to comment on the significance of the tragic element in Arthur. Um, not only because it's in the Arthurian story, but it struck me that in most uh, British mythology it's there. So, like, you go back to Saxon times, Beowulf, well, he is killed at the end of the poem, fighting the dragon. Uh, the Battle of Malden is about Saxons going down in a blaze of glory. Even Robin Hood, you know, in one of the earliest rendi renditions of it, uh, the guest of Robin Hood, he eventually dies. Uh, he is kind of deceived by a nun uh, and is weakened in various ways. So this seems like a, a, a key idea within the mythos, and it's there in Arthur. Um, so, yeah, but what, what do you both think of that? Well, um, you used a, a term at the start of our conversation, Nathan, you mentioned that he was sleeping. And in in the, the tale itself, part of the mythology is, is you're correct in mentioning the, the tragedy or the fool, if you like, but that fool is temporary. Um, so um, this idea of the king being asleep under, typically, uh, I think, associated with with the vision or the imagery of under a hill or some sort of mountain, um, you know, as though he's sort of snoozing contentedly until he's awoken in the hour of need. Uh, I, I noticed that in 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 the book, I've got the account of his legends. I read they they they, they spoke of um, his last sleep. So although the, there is a fall, it there's not there's the question of the finality of Arthur. I think is is maybe called into question there. Um, when he's when he's spoken about um it's with reference to his immortality so king arthur holds this supposedly the essence of immortality and probably one of the only mythical heroes i can think of that's endowed with that enduring longevity um i i forget I'm, i think it was jeffrey of monmouth who wrote 
Britons believe yet that he is alive and lives in Avalon with the fairest of all elves, and Britons ever yet expect that Arthur will come to life. And I suppose that second line, that kind of ever expectation that he will again come to life, is a, is a big part of uh, the essence of Arthur. He's, yes, there is a sort of, I guess I, we spoke about a hiatus at the beginning of a conversation, hopefully not tragic, um, but one of the, the, I suppose, the enduring and um, enchanting uh, parts of Arthur's story is that it, it's temporary, that he is either sleeping or in slumber temporarily, but will return. Um, and it's part of that immortality that is in, there's, there's, he's not a mortal, it's not a mortal fool, um, because he, he, I suppose that's the idea of the return, is it not? So I don't know what that, that means for Arthur, but I suppose as for his I don't know whether you'd sort of see him as a kind of uh, a tragic hero in that sense or not, but ultimately he's a representative of kingship that is yet to return again. So I don't know, maybe this question of, of a final trage tragedy, it, it's quite rare that he doesn't carry that. Um, his is sort of enduring and everlasting, uh, maybe cyclical, I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I think I think you're on something in in the cyclical. I, I was just going to mention, you know, there's in the Excalib Excalibur film. There's that cracking line: "The king and the land are one," and uh, you know, there's this sense in which um, Arthur's reign is not only kind of fixing the social order. There's a kind of cosmological uh, harmony brought about by that. It's the uh, axis mundi, the pillar of the world, found in the true king. This is quite common across. Uh, ancient and medieval peoples this idea but in Arthur we see it and there's almost a sense in which he is like his return is going to restore the land so you could maybe tie him in with like a green man type figure you know the the coming of spring out of the winter I see that very much with Arthur um so so I, th I think you're right on that part at point um I, I wonder also if it's it's a kind of transfiguration of this um this idea that you know the the hero goes down in a blaze of glory death and suffering ultimately come for us all but in arthur um he he is almost like a, a christ-like figure overcoming that um that death so it's a it's a kind of christian uh re reinterpretation of those older maybe pagan ideas uh rupert you were going to come in yeah, I mean the the way that I have commonly interpreted it is 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 almost like a forewarning in some ways, and I I think I view the a lot of the stories in general like like the well no, the the aspects of the story in general like this is that they are kind of like uh, aspects or or forewarnings of this uh, of something um, more general perhaps. Um, in particular, I can't help but notice that even just uh, in much more secular history, the 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 greatest flaw faced by great men oftentimes is the uh the lesser men that they must surround themselves with uh, and so that that sort of comes through very clearly in the case of arthur where uh it, the, some of the other men around him and although they might be good in other ways they uh they fall short of the of this the, of what is perhaps required of them or what is necessary uh, and so because they are falling short of that kind of perfection because of course they must they're men uh then uh they they sort of bring the realm down when it's almost at its uh highest point i mean i've also heard it said um because I, th I think it's in the uh joffrey of monmouth version that you, you could you could perhaps make the point that uh the mistake that arthur makes is to go abroad and everything sort of falls apart in his absence and you could make you could make some point about that uh, in the case of the english in general is that when we are uh, away from our from our garden as it were then everything sort of falls apart without the maintenance without the proper maintenance when you see that with Robin Hood as well, don't you? It's the absence of the king which allows for his uh, wicked administrators essentially to to pillage the land for their own benefit. And Robin is forced to kind of administer the king's justice in his absence. It's only with the king's return uh, from the Crusades, in this case, Richard the Lionheart, that order will be restored. So I think you're definitely right there that it's almost like the king is the, um, the anchor point by which all things have to converge. If, if you pull that out, the order collapses, the, the framework disappears. Um, but it can't just be any king, it's the true king, right? It's one that's virtuous and has 
the strength of will to follow the uh, the divine call. Yeah, I mean, per perhaps uh, heretically, you, you could look at someone like uh, Henry V in this kind of view, where mm. he is the uh, the son of a usurper, and um, and although he is um, he's able to accomplish some great things in his lifetime, it's it, it's all quite fragile ultimately, and it, it sort of falls apart through uh, providential mishaps, you might say. Mm -hmm. No, that's I mean that that seems reasonable, and I think I think um, some of the figures that we'll be looking at as well probably have that. Um, these aspects to them too, uh, that they do bring order in, but ultimately, perhaps certain expeditions or so on uh, are their downfall in various ways. Um, I, I guess it just uh, a further question before we get to the kind of historical examples of Arthurian restoration. This this kind of idea of um, Arthur's. Arthur's immortality and him being like more than just a man in it almost he he becomes like semi semi divine or a link with the divine how how do you think that works with with the mythology like is it like do we have to divide the not only the historical Arthur but the legendary Arthur from then what he becomes in in his time of sleep and return? I mean, I, I would probably say something like uh, kings kings in general, perhaps, are, are the absolute peak and the, uh, the closest to uh, divinity that is afforded to uh, secular men and, and secular authorities, perhaps, the closest to the closest to God. And so the best of kings must necessarily be the closest, the closest to divinity of, of, of all secular men. Yeah, and of course, the king um, really, I suppose, historically is the supposedly the the mouthpiece of God, sort of uh, the, the the spokesperson of the divine. So it makes sense that he was his myth lived in tandem with the, uh, the well, the Christian idea of the messianic return. That, that would make that would make sense as, as something not as I said earlier, not replacing Christ, but um, as closely closely bound to the divinity of Christ. So, I mean, Arthur, I don't know, I don't know at what point his knighthood uh, is replaced by his king kingship or, or because I suppose you think of a knight as somebody who's in service. So I, I actually don't know how those two work together, but um, perhaps he's the kind of pinnacle of, of the knight of Christ. I'm not sure, but um, that it would make sense that question of, of immortality and return again in the Christian, in the Christian tradition, at least, you yeah. know, well, I'd, pr I'd probably separate them, uh, and so I wouldn't even necessarily categorize Arthur as a knight per se, because he uh, part part of the um, part of the whole point, I guess, of the uh, drawing the sword from the stone is demonstrating that he he was the king all along, even though he was not he was not known as being such, and so he's able to demonstrate his his pedigree immediately. So he he didn't he didn't he never really occupied that position of knight. He was he was always a king, and. Uh, and he, he he merely goes from an unrecognized king to a recognized king, and then uh, and then is able to actually properly ascend and uh, attain his not only his true status but also kind of align the realm in general to um, heavenly aims. I, I think um, that that's or perhaps really a divine good. ordering. Yes, yes, and I mean I mean you can see these ideas in the the notion of the king as pontifex, so the bridge builder between heaven and earth, or the sacred and the mundane. And I think Arthur definitely is that character. And we see this in, and I know this is a late example, but Tennyson's idyls or idyls or however you want to pronounce it. The the thing with Arthur in that is it, it consistently compares him to Lancelot. Lancelot is the best at the joust, at the tourneys, at the, you know, the knightly activities. But Arthur is the greatest warrior. And so when they're fighting the heathen hordes in the name of God, it is Arthur who leads the charge and crushes the enemy. Lancelot is not the greatest warrior in that. So there is this kind of distinction between uh, the knight, who Lancelot is the greatest knight out of all of them at that point in the story, but Arthur is the great warrior of the divine. So he's a, he's almost like a, a vessel of divine uh, justice and judgment in a way that none of the other knights can be. 
Yeah, a lot of the tales do speak about his sort of savage uh, warriorship um, mm. in dealing with the slaying of um, giants, supposedly, monsters and witches, um, often out on daring adventures and and crusades. Uh, so, and, and often they refer to his sort of great military leadership. So I suppose... I suppose, as you, as you say, it's maybe the question of him being the sort of the figurehead of knighthood as opposed to knight in itself. I mean, one, one of the other things as well is that um, it, you can see some notable, notable differences in other places. So his uh, sort of diplomatic um, streak, as opposed to the way that the, the knights are often sort of jostling with one another and uh, and trying to compete for you know the greatest honors and the uh, the highest position and the um you know the, the greatest status amongst them all and you can't you can't have the king partaking in that as well and so one of one of arthur's great um triumphs essentially is to be able to approach them as equals and deal with them equally um, and and get them to work in common cause rather than against one another and that's that that's what the round table ultimately represents is that the the ability for them to all uh, sort of come together on relatively equal terms they, they all recognize him as king so that so it's not it's not outright egalitarian in that in that way but uh there's a sense in which they can all be respected and honored i think that's a great point go ahead daughter of albion oh so i was just thinking about how he responds of course to um to guinevere when she's accused of murder after he learns of the well i suppose the affair between her and lancelot and uh the text says that he's sort of impar an impartial and fair judge, despite being sad. His his judgment was calm and reasonable. I always thought he, yeah, so obviously quite the stoic there. He doesn't let his own person become higher than his role as the king, I guess. Like he, um, because the natural thing to do would be to want vengeance, but he's he's making the decisions in terms of no, I as the king must make a just judgment here as to what must be done. Um, and, and in some ways, you can see that as um, partly why his relationship with Guinevere falls apart, because the king is not um, like any other mortal human being in that office. He is uh, His interests are not those of two lovers, let's say, um, or, the, or the lover's interest in another person. He sees everybody as it, from the impartial view of God. So that becomes a difficult thing. Uh, which then Guinevere can find in Lancelot that she can't find in Arthur. But I mean, perhaps one of the um, one of the things about him that's so remarkable is that there's so little that can be drawn, or like so little distinction that can be drawn between his personal self and his kingly self, and so he fully he fully embodies that uh, that role, rather than um, having a sense in which he is he is simultaneously a you know a private person who has. Who has his own sort of like quirks and shortcomings, and then contrasted against that is uh, is how he appears in court. I don't think there's much there's, there's much distinction that you can draw between those two those two persons of uh, of Arthur, and so that's probably one of the things that makes him so uh, well such a perfected or you know as close to perf to the perfect king as uh, as we've seen perhaps. Yeah, I guess um, when people talk about uh, the late queen's service. Th that's like a, a shadow of what we're seeing in Arthur, right? He's he's totally given himself to the service of uh, the monarchy and thus of the land and his domain and to God ultimately. Um, and that is that is his virtue. Is you're right. It's the, you shouldn't divide between the personal and the the um, the office. It's that the personal has been subsumed into the office, perhaps. Well, no. My, my point is that in in off in other cases, you might be able to draw a, a clear mm. distinction between those two. Uh, whereas in the case of Arthur, it's much harder to do, and that's probably a, a mark of how remarkable of a king he is. Mm. So it's almost as though the the like the idealized uh, role of the king is uh, is something which can be which can be approached, but for most, except you know Arthur accepted, uh, they fall short in some way. And, uh, and and the personal kind of slips in slips in a little bit more, and there's there's more more of the vice that that comes through, and more of the more of the shortcomings that uh, that mean he mean that, that means uh, the king falls short of uh, of what is sort of demanded of him. Whereas in in Arthur in, in Arthur's case, that that is uh, very difficult to identify. Yeah, he he is the ideal then in that regard. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
or you know Carlyle talks about these heroic individuals as being absolutely sincere in their devotion to the transcendent uh, laws of nature or to God's laws and I guess and Arthur is that perfectly yeah it's, sincerity is going to be a very uh, is, is a very key point here I think that's uh, mm -hmm. that's important to sort of hold on to that so so with that in mind then uh, let us turn then to some of the examples of how Arthur's return has been um, employed or manifested in uh, English and British history and uh, Rupert you, you're probably the person to to ask on on these various figures to kind of introduce them so perhaps the first place we should begin is Henry the uh, second who we've spoken about before on a previous stream restorers of the world um, but Rupert ha um, what's the relationship here between Arthur and Henry yeah so um, if you did listen to that stream then some of this might sound a bit familiar but essentially Joffrey of Monmouth, uh, who is the sort of first character to, or the, the first writer to really popularize Arthur in, um, in the historical tradition that we'd recognize. Uh, and prior to that, what he's drawing from are a collection of uh, sources that are, are either well, stories that we can't verify externally and uh, sources that we can't otherwise identify or find. And so he's basically the furthest back that we can go for something concrete and especially the, uh, the sort of complete story. And he gains a lot of popularity in the um so he, he's, he's writing in gains popularity in the uh like a little bit before and sort of during the period of the anarchy and this is where the the house of normandy sort of uh comes unstuck and there's a a period of complete disintegration of of royal power and it would not be inaccurate to basically describe England at this point as being run run by a series of warlords, basically, um, where the extent to which different men in, uh, in their various localities, especially in places like the North and, uh, and the West, their, their power is, is essentially the extent to which they can bring arms to bear and bring military force to bear. And uh, otherwise, the king is not really able to do anything other than uh, this is King Stephen is not really able to do anything more than sort of protect his own his own position, uh, but it's vastly vastly diminished and sort of continues diminishing. And Henry the Second is sort of brought up in this uh, in this kind of environment to an extent. He um, he alongside many of the other men that um, that he serves alongside and uh, like his, his retainers both in future and uh, at the time are raised on a lot of these sorts of stories and in their popularity, uh, which is not only occurring in England at the time, but because it's been translated into French by this point, it's actually gaining popularity elsewhere as well. And so I believe this is coming at a lot of the same kind of time as the uh, the Provencal troubadours and their sort of popularization of uh, of the romances. And, and the, these two things are, are very sort of like closely connected because the Arthurian romances and the sort of troubadour romances have a, a significant amount of crossover. And yeah, what it means is that uh, when Henry II is, uh, is in a position to try to regain his uh, well, to, to gain the throne, basically, on uh, th through his mother, um, Empress Matilda. He is coming with this, the knightly ideals, and the knightly ideals having been instilled into a lot of the men below him, um, uh, you know, his, his assorted knights, but also the, the idea of a returned Arthur being something that is expected amongst the population. And so he's able to kind of embody this myth, and as the first Plantagenet, he ends up stamping the Plantagenet dynasty as a whole, which sort of comes back with this idea of being the uh, the returned Arthur. And it has a lot of interesting parallels in other ways as well. But like, um, I believe he brings a lot of Bretons with him as well, who are obviously the the, the descendants of the Britons who, who fled uh, from, I can't remember who exactly, but, you know, settled in the, uh, in the, the peninsula of Brittany, modern day, you know, modern, modern day Brittany, and even then, except obviously they had a much stronger um, localized identity at the time. But it sort of, he uses this as not only a way to legitimize himself, um, but it also gives him a sort of clear path by which he can reestablish his order, reestablish the sort of like royal prerogative powers and uh, gives himself the sort of uh, boost he needs to set everything right in England again. And, and so in that sense, he is very uh, successfully seen as the, the returned Arthur because he is able to come back set all of these different uh, warring parties and warlords who had been squabbling over, you know, potentially very minor, um, you know, minor issues, 
much as the Britons had in the Brythonic um, heroic age, and he's able to sort of set things right again and reimpose law, reimpose the order, and reimpose a, uh, a sovereign king who is able to rule justly over over all, more or less equally. I think that's an excellent explanation, and uh, I would just add a couple of things. Uh, one of one of the really in interesting things is Geoffrey of Monmouth's History of the Kings of Britain is actually dedicated primarily to Robert the First Earl of Gloucester, who, when Henry the, Henry comes over to England for the first time, he's basically in his faction. He's in his camp against Stephen. So we have a, a very clear kind of uh, connection there uh, where Henry might have encountered some of jo Geoffrey's writings. But, but with that, there's a number of uh, 12th century writers before and after Henry who comment on the belief of the, the British that Arthur will return. And I, I thought I would just uh, give a couple of quotations here because I think it, it will help people to see that the, there's actually concrete evidence of this belief. It wasn't just um, something that we're conjecturing. So for, for example, William of Malmesbury, in 1125, so a bit before uh, Henry, writes, this is Arthur about whom the Britons rave nonsensically today. Not only do they invent false tales, but also they foretell truths of history. And then going on uh, towards uh, Henry of Huntington, yet the Britons deny his death and regularly expect his coming. If I turn the page here, we have in Wace, Wace writes um, probably the first formal account of Arthur's return. Uh, and there's an addition to his work, which says Britons believe yet that he is alive and lives in Avalon with the fairest of all elves and Britons ever yet expect that Arthur will come to life. Uh, probably the most um, dramatic kind of example of this is by Peter of Blois in 1160 and this is interesting given what you were saying daughter of albion earlier about um you know the christian messianic return because he says perhaps it is with arthur of britain just as it is with the jewish messiah perhaps i shall await the coming of arthur with the britons and the coming of the messiah with the jews so this isn't just some kind of um uh kind of nonsense folktale, it seems like people genuinely believed during this period that Arthur was going to return in a way similar to Christ returning, and that this um, then provides a kind of field of expectation for a figure like Henry to stride forth and restore justice and order to this wild place of England. <laughs> Am I not right? I'm thinking that it, in um, in Cheshire, there's a site, Alderley Edge, where supposedly the the it holds the legend of the cavern of full of knights that are awaiting uh, a call to decide the fate of England, and and I think this is still a very popular place of not pilgrimage necessarily, but um, I know there are a number of places in Cornwall as well at Tintagel. Uh, I think it's interesting how they've managed to hold on to their that. Uh, longevity of that myth as well um, as places people I don't know if either of you have visited though H have you I haven't myself only to Tintagel in Cornwall where his supposed castle is but I know Alderley Edge is the place where um, I don't know if it's Wace who who wrote as well supposedly on the tomb it's written here lies Arthur the once and future king once and future by the way I think is quite interesting as well both past and to be resurrected, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, no, I've not, I've not visited either of those places, but I have visited a, uh, a supposed location in uh, in Shropshire. I think it's in southwest Shropshire, um, which is uh, supposedly the site of Avalon. Well, this is one of the things with with Arthur is so. So you were mentioning like uh, this hollow cavern in the south. Well, in Scotland, there's examples of hills where they'll say these are hollow hills where Arthur and his knights are sleeping, waiting to arise. And one day a shepherd wandered in. He was following his lost sheep and Arthur told him off because his time was not yet. Uh, so that kind of speaks to something that actually it's it's not just that this is a an archetype within our culture and it's not just located to, with one group. 
although the Welsh probably have a very strong claim, it's actually something which um, people from all over these isles have sought to identify with themselves in a very particular way, even though like the same story could be told somewhere else. And I think that's really fascinating because it's not because it's tying again the story with the land itself. Yeah, it shows how extensively the the myth penetrates um, every part of the Isle, really, from Cornwall up to Scotland. And I know uh, I know you're a big fan of Wagner, but I mean, of course, in Germany, the Arthurian they have their own sort of mythology, of course. But many of the Wagnerian myths are aesthetically. I think uh, it was Arthur Rackham who also illustrated mm. the the Wagner tales as well. Very, very similar aesthetic and uh, romantic Spenserian um, aesthetics and mythology there as well. So there's a lot, of, they, they, they seem to transverse the same sort of universe quite a lot. I, th I think so. And there's a lot of crossovers, isn't there? Um, for example, Sigurd draws the sword from the tree, which only the mighty warrior can draw uh, and uh, planted there by Odin. Whereas in Arthur's case, it's Merlin who plants the sword in the stone and only the worthy king can draw it. So there, there seems to be a strong parallels. And of course, you know, Germanic peoples, right? So we can, uh, both in Germany and in England. So perhaps that's that's part of it too. Um, I, I wanted to, to draw attention to something else you said, Rupert, because um, with Henry II, the... Uh, you know, he he comes in in a time of anarchy, and it's it's we often use anarchy to describe things in a light way, but actually, like this was genuine um, breakdown of law and order with barons tyrannizing, uh, gangs robbing. It wasn't a safe place, England at all, and he comes in and is able to establish order and justice. And one of the ways he does this is by essentially taking. Uh, legal power away from local barons and sending out his own uh, justice of the peace justices of the peace or administrators of royal courts in his name to make decisions on his behalf and he himself also uh, holds court and has many decisions being made by himself uh, sitting over uh, legal matters and this is quite like Arthur Arthur sits at court at Camelot or Caerleon or you know, one of these other uh, residences. And people will come to him saying, look, I've been wronged. These knights are robbing me. And rather than go himself, one of his knights will take up the quest and deliver the king's justice to that area. They will administer his will and bring about order within the kingdom. So I think there's a very strong parallel there between Henry II and what we see of King Arthur. Uh, it's almost like he's modelled himself on that. Yeah, there definitely is that. But I, I would draw, a, I, I myself would draw emphasis back to a point that you made in that it's um, part, of, part of this whole equation and, and something that I'm, uh, I'm probably going to continue to go at great lengths to, to uh, highlight is that it's as much about the acceptance of the, of the people to be able to recognize and well accept this the great man returning and the great king returning that allows him to actually be able to restore order to a certain degree so that you know the power isn't entirely in in the hands of anyone else but there is definitely a sense to which the uh, the barons could have tried to maintain everything that they had in as much as possible but the um the fatigue and the the change in values, which had been presaged by a an appreciation of the uh, the romances, is part of what allowed order and justice to return to the realm. I think I think that's definitely right, and I mean, there's there's two things I want to kind of comment on that uh, because one is um, there's almost a sense in, and we'll see this with a, n a number of these figures that a crisis is required for such a king to exist. And it's not only that such a king can solve this problem, it's that people are so driven by the, the desperate situation, the total collapse of society, essentially, means that they're, they're suddenly willing to allow for this figure to have such power over their lives because they, they recognize how terrible it is without that figure. Whereas if they've if they're still within some sort of um, secure position, 
it almost seems like they're going to be resistant. So it, it requires this kind of total breakdown for an Arthurian figure to, to rise up. Yeah, I mean, uh, such such men come out of come out of a crisis almost necessarily, um, but uh, yeah, like, like you said, just the the sense in which uh, people need to be uh, dis uh, disabused of their hubris to some to some degree to uh, mm -hmm. to be sort of like willing and have and have an open mind and, and be able to much more earnestly and far less cynically uh, look for somebody who's going to be able to uh, you know write things to some to some degree. The earnestness and the uh, the humility with which one has to uh, approach these kind of circumstances is, I don't think, can be understated because it does come out of one of these severe crises. I mean, just to look ahead again, the next time, the next time there's a major civil war is uh, is incidentally the next time uh, you know a long period of civil war is is the next time that there's a, a renaissance in um, in the Arthurian mythos, and I don't think that's coincidental. No, definitely not. Um, and and in kind of touching on that. You, you mentioned that, you know, it requires the people to accept. I think it also requires that there's others around somebody like Henry who really believe in this with very sincerely, not only in the, the kind of mythos, but the chivalric code, which comes with that. And just, just to clarify, when we're saying chivalry, we're not talking about just holding open doors for, for women, because I think that's what it gets reduced to. It's a code of honor, of um, piety, of charity, of doing what's right, even though it's a threat to yourself, defending the weak and poor and innocent from unjust and wicked forces, symbolized by the dragon, for example. And uh, William the Marshal, or William Marshall, was probably the greatest example of this. Um, could you say a little bit about him, Rupert? Because I think he perfectly encapsulates the... the if Stephen... Uh, sorry, if Henry is Arthur then he is very much a knight of the round table, William. Yeah. Um, I mean, he's he's widely regarded as one of the greatest, if not the greatest knights. And uh, to some extent it is with, uh, with good reason because he does embody a lot of these virtues, not only in the fact that he was an excellent, uh, an excellent fighter and uh, an excellent tournament fighter in particular. Um, so he was, he was accomplished physically, but also his, uh, his strength of character, which uh, allowed him to, Basically, maintain maintain a fairly righteous course even after he'd been personally wronged. So it was under uh, King John in particular where he was um, disabused of his well, you know, he he, he was disempowered from his uh, his traditional positions. He was he, he was having his property despoiled in Ireland um, in uh, in Leinster, his possessions there, um, and he was he was lied to to his face by the king um, who had who had him in captivity at the time, telling him that. Uh, that his knights had uh, deserted him and that his wife had been taken hostage um, and that there was nothing he could do and, and he might as well just, uh, you know, give in and and just accept accept his new, newer lowly status. Um, but he, he didn't, he didn't lash out, he didn't, um, he didn't bow his head. Instead, he just sort of uh, towed the line and, and like waited basically for, for word, which which would ultimately tell him as he believed. And so it was true that uh, his, his knights hadn't deserted him. His, his lands hadn't been despoiled, though they had been attacked. And ultimately, although this, this ended up causing the, uh, one of the Baron's Wars, the first, I believe, um, he was ultimately one of the figures who, even despite all those personal affronts uh, and despite those, those attacks, he actually stayed loyal to royal authority and the king. And he's, he's, so loyal that when the realm is, when the king dies and it falls to uh, you know someone else to run the uh, the kingdom as a as a regent, essentially, it's put into the hands of William Marshall because he is he, he is by far the most trustworthy figure. And even though again he's been personally wronged, he stays by his uh, his chivalric virtues and his uh, his honor and his his dutifulness, and he stays stays the course and uh, does not corrupt the realm in any way for his own benefit you know perhaps in in opposition to the uh the regent of um you know the, the king john of uh robin hood fame of the robin hood stories he's he's, he's almost the, op yeah. the opposite in that he, he has has he has every reason to corrupt the realm for his own benefit and to be cynical to cynically use his position or to even just cynically follow 
whatever his uh, you know sort of baser instincts, and perhaps you might even say reason, are telling him that he should do, he should be doing. But he stays the course the whole time. He stays loyal. He's absolutely loyal, and it's not just with the uh, one or two kings. It's like every king, he's absolutely he's absolutely devoted to serving them in every war context. So when Henry's sons rebel against him, he fights for Henry, even though Henry's kind of on a losing wicket. He stays with Henry. Then it's with Richard. Then it's with John. And then being the steward. So he's the perfect uh, example. He's a real life example of that um, dutiful obedience to your Lord, serving something much higher than yourself, even when it doesn't seem to be in your interest. Or you could, you know, his, as you said, he had every, in a kind of common sense view, you would say he had every right to seek revenge for what John did to him. And when he got the position of steward, he could have easily kind of taken it all for himself, but he didn't. He didn't. He's, a, he's quite a remarkable figure. Is it is it worth just commenting uh, briefly on kind of the parallels perhaps between Henry and Arthur insofar as one of, well, in Henry's case, his sons turn against him and kind of bring about civil war. I mention this in part because during the uh, c contemporary reports at the time use the prophecies of Merlin, which is a which is an interesting book with um, Je Joffrey uh, kind of tr brought into the uh, history of the kings of Britain, and one of them is about how the um, the king will be sundered from his offspring, and there will be civil war once more in the land, and they use this to kind of analyze uh, Henry is fulfilling this prophecy, so. Uh, contemporary commentators were definitely seeing it in that light. Yeah, I mean the the betrayal of Mordred is is something that is interesting insofar as it's uh, replicated almost by uh, the sons, the, the famously treacherous sons of Henry II, which which is curious in the context of his sons also being raised in this same tradition. So they are raised on the same romances and the same tales of chivalry, and so perhaps you could say. Um, that you that you could perhaps spy some of the uh, the conflicts inherent in the stories, um, in that the sons find themselves to be chafing under the authority of their father, who they they want to get they want to get out from under him, and they want to be able to go and fulfil their own quests, but they they can't while he's continuing to rule and continuing to be in in uh, in his you know for for the time relatively omnipotent position, and so they they rebel against him, uh, even with his own wife, their mother, uh, fighting against fighting against her husband, Eleanor of Aquitaine. Um, so I'm sure there's a lot there's a there's additional parallels that you could draw there, but the fact that it didn't bring down the realm is is you know obviously something that is to be um, <laughs> to be lauded by comparison to the the Arthurian tale. But it is it, it is something which kind of um, squanders the energies at the high point of the uh, the Angevin Empire, you might say, because it sort of never really get they never really uh, are able to strengthen themselves much beyond that point they 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 reach their their apex and then sort of descend into civil war which ultimately fractures fractures the empire to the extent that it, it's gradually picked apart by France over the ensuing over the ensuing decades I almost wonder and this is just a speculative point Rupert, oh, you've well, just 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 one other point though, quickly just to just to illustrate uh, illustrate the point that uh, men like Richard the First who came afterwards and who was rebelling against his father Henry the Second um, that they they were raised and did believe in these kinds of stories is um, Richard the First is supposed to have given gifts uh, that were related to the Arthurian mythos and uh, and that were you know quite highly sought after when when these stories were perhaps at the height of their continental popularity so I believe he's supposed to have given away um, Excalibur as a uh, as a gift. Which is quite a gift to give away. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You know, perhaps, perhaps uh, foolish in that sense, but you know, it, it, it is what it is. Clearly, clearly, he clearly he believed to some degree, to some great mm -hmm. degree. And well, I, w I was just going to kind of make a speculative point on Richard, in that obviously he spent a lot of time on crusade, uh, perhaps to the detriment of of the kingdom, but perhaps the crusade came too late in some ways because. You, you've written on Rupert, and uh, I've kind of commented on the, the the necessity for young men, particularly a, you know like a prince like Richard, to be able to build their own kingdom, to go out and establish themselves and uh, civilize a wilderness under their own auspices. 
and you know they were chafing under under Henry. But perhaps if the crusade had come while Henry was king, Richard could have gone off and done that and built his his kind of uh, glory out there without having to redirect it against or without have, directing it against Henry. Whereas when it comes to the crusade, he's actually the wrong person to go in a sense because he is the king at that point. It's something the prince should go and do, really, because um, it leaves a vacuum within the within the nation. Yeah, I mean, one one could perhaps speculate that Richard was uh, was not seeing himself so much in in the Arthurian mold, but more in the more in the the mold of uh, one of the knights. And so, um, yeah, he he was more interested in going off and questing and trying to trying to find the the relics, trying to find the Grail, and trying to. Uh, you know, fulfill fulfill great quests, great Christian Christian quests that are put before him, rather than actually administering the realm, which seems to have bored him. Well, it, this is something that's always fascinated me: is that you know, when people talk about the Grail, they often associate it with King Arthur, but Arthur himself does not go in search for the Grail in most of the stories. It's his knights that go, um, and particularly, I'm thinking of like Galahad and Percival or Parsifal in various uh, other dish, um, versions, are the ones that achieve the quest. And they don't come back to the realm with the Grail either. So there is this sense in which it is something which is distinct from uh, King Arthur's reign in some way, that it's not tied to his um, sovereignty. It's a, it's a kind of different path or vocation pursuing the Grail from uh, establishing a just order uh, establishing the land as it ought to be. Not only that, but um, the the discovery of the Grail and almost like you could say the high point of the knights and the high point of the questing, uh, mm. the questing culture is um, is actually reached after the downfall of the kingdom. Yes, yes, that's right. So, so when when the Arthurian world has already fallen is is when you get the sort of like final uh, the final legacy of. Arthur, in the form of his uh, his remaining knights, going out and fulfilling their sort of final quests. Hmm. Yeah, that's an interesting kind of tension in the story because if you because we you know we've been talking about the sacred and and uh, the king kind of bringing that into the civil society, but so you would assume he would be the one to go and get the Grail. That would be kind of if I, if you were kind of writing the Hollywood blockbuster version of it, that's what you would do. But it's not, uh, and I, I just think that's fascinating. That there's, it, it kind of implies to me that there's some sense in which he, although he is an embodiment of the sacred in one sense, he doesn't that like uh, that kingship path isn't necessarily the the closest one can get to the divine. That's a different path uh, for somebody like Parsifal, uh, daughter of Albion. Um, just regarding the Grail, I think it's actually Lancelot who goes in search. Uh, there's a great number of medieval illuminated manuscripts I know that, um, uh, that focus on Lancelot being the one to pursue it. So just as you say, what I really like about the Arthurian legends is, despite Arthur being at the figurehead, it, there's this lovely almost a kind of world, a, a bit sort of Tolkien-esque, you know, there's a whole sort of Middle Earth of uh, various, you have these other characters that bleed into the story that you, you could almost create a map and a, maybe someone has, I have to look it up, um, you know, the world of Middle Earth is a little bit like the world of um, of, of King Arthur and you have all the kind of subplots and uh, every knight has their own biography uh every uh, knight has their own sort of love affair and i kind of like that they uh it's almost like a, a tree of these of chivalric romance that that kind of goes off into branches into its own uh, realm of stories and each of the knights is connected with one of those and i wonder if i suppose each one of them maybe uh, represents a kind of uh p part of the code of honor it's like a I, I don't know. It's. I, I suppose I, I just really like that it's kind of a literary cycle in one. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm quite sure it, it's Lancelot who goes in search of, of the Grail. But um, the various parts of the story, when you have entire medieval manuscripts just focusing on the the, the affair of, between Lancelot and Guinevere, and of uh, you know um, e even even dedicated to her and her upbringing. So I, I really like that. I, I think it, there's a sort of idiom for, for each part of life, um, almost a bit like the Pilgrim's Progress, I guess, in a way. 
but yeah, I'm, I'm not that familiar with his quest for the Grail. But but also, you know, the story then that leads into this, the whole story, the biography of Merlin, and um, mm. each one's sort of connected under the figurehead of of Arthur. Yeah, I think that's a great way to put it. It's it's Arthur can contain multitudes, you might say. He's right. able to sustain all of these people, and in a, it's not about dragging them under his will. It's almost he wants them to flourish and go out and be the best version of Lancelot or Galahad as Lancelot and Galahad can be. And that is in itself a service to him. But he's also kind of creating a space for that. Um, I th I, yeah, I, th I think that's totally right. There's a, there's a depth and all, there's a kind of organic richness there too. Um, it's, it's not all just focused on Arthur. It's this whole world that you can learn about every night. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite fascinating. Just just on Lancelot and the and the quest, he does go in search of it in some versions, but it's actually his illegitimate son Galahad who will achieve the quest, oh, not Lancelot himself. And I wonder if that's in part, you know, he has this affair with Guinevere, also with Elaine in some versions, uh, where Galahad comes from. So, is there this sense then in which he is unable to do so because he has fallen, because he has broken his vows to his king, to his god? And thus, he is not worthy, ultimately, to to achieve the Grail. Well, in that case, they sort of they, they a little bit like the Pilgrim's Progress, maybe contain uh, it, it's sort of parables of morality with within the Arthurian romance uh, universe, if you like. It's sort of oh, each no. one, each story has its own little Aesop's fable in miniature type thing. Don't say Universal or uh, Marvel will be buying it over, you know. <laughs> The Arthurian multiverse, yeah. I can see it now. <laughs> That's a great name for an article. Someone's got to do it. Rupert, you got to do it. Yeah, Rupert, please do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, shall we move along then to perhaps Edward the Third? Um, and I, I know we could talk about Edward the First, but I'm I'm conscious of time. So Edward the Third, um, Rupert, could you? Uh, clue us into his connection with Arthur, which is very strong, very strong. Yeah, I mean, as as I uh, as I sort of alluded to or well, stated outright, the um, the Plantagenets in general are, are quite fond of uh, the Arthurian mythos, and they and they do the Arthurian legend, and they they tie themselves quite a few of them tie themselves very closely to it, and it it, it does undergo a renaissance after maybe one or like one or two generations of a uh, bit of of lull after. Sort of, you know, the generation after Henry the Second age age out somewhat, and then it, it seems like things sort of uh, get a bit more vulgar again to some degree. But there's un under Edward the First, and then even more um, prominently under Edward the Third, there's a deliberate attempt to resurrect the the Arthurian legend and uh, sort of like re popularize the the stories, not least because. Edward III himself is is kind of uh, styling himself as a, a kind of renewed, uh, returned Arthur. Except in this case, the the actual circumstances are slightly different because obviously he's he's coming to a kingdom which is you know not entirely stable, but um, the problems that it that it faces are far more um, mild compared to say the anarchy. And what that what that essentially means is that more of what uh, Edward III is tapping into are the the conquests and the and some of the other exploits of Arthur. So, for example, um, earlier in the case of Edward I, he's using the the Arthurian claim to uh, legitimise his rule in in Wales, and then uh, he I think he he might do the same for Scotland as well. And so the idea is he that does, uh, yes, he does. Yeah, he he says he's the Arthur was overlord of Scotland, therefore the King of England, i.e., me, should be overlord of Scotland. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but Edward III is is doing it in a much, in a much more cultural way. So not only is he is he doing the same kind of thing of um, lodging his claim on uh, France to some degree by um, you know pointing to the the conquests of uh, Geoffrey of Monmouth's version of uh, of Arthur and trying to push his claim that way, as well as his sort of inherent dynastic claims. Um, but he's also trying to present his new knightly order as as a renewed 
Knights of the Round Table. In that case, it's the Order of the Garter. But um, initially, I believe they do they do try to uh, sort of have a round table that they're going to actually sort of meet around. And uh, this idea of questing is is something which is also sort of uh, pushed into and, and, and inculcated into this first generation of um, Knights of the Garter. But it, carry, it carries a little bit further as well because it, it goes into um, this idea of a population which is neither wholly... Well, so just like a, a kind of third third population, not not one that is Saxon, like specifically Saxon, not one that is specifically Norman, but something that is much more generally English. And so this idea of the Brythonic, like the much more indigenous Brythonic people that came before, and the the idea of the Britons uh, and the the English who have a kind of collective claim on the the Arthurian legend and the uh, the legacy of Arthur is something that which is tapped into to try and be a unifying factor and a unifying feature that is. Uh, that is something that could, that a culture can be built around, like a new unified culture, rather than having these two di disparate classes with disparate origins. I think that's a great final point there, Rupert, in terms of the... It, Wagner spoke about the Germanic peoples, and he would say the English too are a hybrid uh, peoples and cultures. Um, and that's very clear from what you've been outlining in terms of the Norman and the Saxon in particular. But then you also have the Brythonic, and these three come together and around this time, it's, you know, the formation of an English people with an English culture and Arthur being that symbol, which is able to unite the three into one and uh, kind of channel the different emphases in the those different forms together. So you've got this kind of more um, uh, Celtic origin story, you know, of Arthur fighting the Saxons and so on. You, you have perhaps uh, Norman chivalry and so on. And these these can come together in Arthur in a way that perhaps other figures wouldn't have been so amenable to. Um, so, so I could definitely see that as a, it's, it's almost like uh, he comes along at the right time in the culture more than anything. But I'd also add as well that he's, um, and you, you mentioned like the conquests of Wales and Scotland and you know, there's various conquests on the continent too. And something we haven't really spoken about is Arthur as a great conqueror that um, in uh, Geoffrey, of, Geoffrey of Monmouth's uh, uh, History of the Kings of Britain, his empire extends to Gaul and he conquers large parts of France. It's also, um, there's also this kind of suggestion that he's uh, in conflict with the papacy at various points in certain versions of the story uh and it, you know it's the true kind of follower of christ as the king the, the priest king he's in conflict with rome and i do wonder as well whether you know edward the third when he was at war with the french in the in the hundred years war and so on the papacy at that point was i believe in avignon and it was supporting the french so there's a there's a suggest I think there's probably an implication there that by styling yourself with, as Arthur, you're making it more amenable to the population that you're in some conflict with the papacy because Arthur did, and he was the great legitimate king. So it's not a position of um, great heresy in that regard. Actually, it's about restoring true Christianity or Catholic faith. Yeah, and uh, and interestingly, it also represents the, so the the invasion like the the hundred years war um especially the sort of when you get to the midpoint of it it, it does represent a uh, a sort of scattering of all these different adventurers as well to uh, to go off and sort of fulfill various ambitions admittedly a lot of them are a lot a lot of them are a lot more secular than um than in the case of the um searching for the grail but there there is definitely a streak of um or, or no although they uh no no scrap that point i can't i, I I, I can't conf I can't confirm it, but I, I, th I think some of them may might take part in the uh, in the Reconquista as well. But no, more more so, it's um, so sort of like various uh, bands that sort of go off and, and try to uh, find their fortune or or uh, pursue their own quests, and and you know across Spain, Italy, France, into Germany, just you know basically all of these English knights who are scattering off in different directions and uh, and all um, you know achieving great things. But that, but that is in an environment that has already been fostered by the uh, the returned Arthur in the form of uh, Edward the Third. So he he imbues them with this um, this kind of 
relatively unified ethic and um, this sort of unified culture and this warrior ethos, and then they they all sort of go off in their own directions and fulfill the fulfill the quests. And you could tie that in with the fact that uh, during this period as well, uh, he expands the peerages quite a lot. So he incorporates many more people with it into the, the kind of upper echelons of society. But at the same time, they're brought together within this chivalric code. They're pledged, they're making oaths to the king in using the language of the Grail quests often. They're attending great feasts um, where there are various round tables and tourneys and and so on so they're being brought into a culture which unites them and it's i think that's quite important because edward the first and edward the second were in quite a lot of tension with the nobility and the barons whereas uh, edward the third seems to be able to integrate them together in quite a powerful way so that there aren't those tensions actually he's actually like enabling people to go off on these these quests for themselves so it's um in terms of you mentioned Arthur's diplomacy being a key factor, Edwards is able to to achieve that himself through the Arthurian ideal. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and and that is one thing that I wanted to mention about Henry II as well. But it, it's it's possibly even more relevant for Edward III is the the element by which uh, courtly splendor and, and the idea of resurrecting Camelot in all of its sort of spectacle and all of the tourneys and all of that kind of thing is, is, is something which very much does accompany the, um, uh, the, the return of, of an Arthur figure. So when Arthur is restored, it, it comes alongside some of this kind of, uh, some of the kind of Merry England that we've, uh, that we've talked about. Could, could you expand on that a little bit, Rupert? Yeah, just so just the idea of like festi festivities, the return of festivities, and, and sort of like fun and spectacle, um, as, as as something which is and you know, and um, you know uh, completely completely in opposition to the kind of uh, you know penny pinching that you just that you'd associate with uh, some other kings who are who are much more concerned with worldly and you know perhaps financial matters. Um, the the re restored Arthur's are much more in the vein of, uh, you know, trying to give us give give spectacles and uh, and bestow splendor and have everything be full of full of color and uh, and merriment and 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 uh, exuberation, exuberance rather. Hmm. They they kind of recognize the need need for rest and for your followers to actually in, kind of enjoy your presence. There's there's something higher than just the, the financial or. The acquisition of power in that respect there's a, there's a kind of investment in in the followers themselves yeah but it's it's also just sort of part of the atmosphere that everyone's sort mm. of brought into yeah very much so uh daughter of albion did you want to to add anything in relation to edward i'm going to be honest my knowledge of the kings uh historically is a little bit scant i've been I, i'm very happy to talk about maybe the sort of print or book history in popular culture but um i've been really enjoying uh, rupert explaining it so I, i'm more of a listener at this point if i'm honest <laughs> no problem at all no problem at all i mean one one thing that i i kind of wanted to ask about was that um the round table itself so edward does commission this in 1277 to be built at winchester it doesn't come to fruition but there are is archaeological evidence that the, the kind of space was made for it and some of it at least was complete but certainly there were ra smaller round tables used at various feasts i just wondered you know beyond just the idea of it what do you think it it does to actually be sitting at something like that given the mythological uh, significance of it especially when you think of the rest of the um the event is very Arthurian too. So the feasting, the jousting, the the entertainments, it, the oath giving, it, it, it's all the kind of reenactment. It, it almost has a kind of quasi, it, like I, I guess, like a religious ceremony is probably the closest many of us could get to that today. But I'm just wondering what, how you both think it would actually impact somebody participating in that. Is it just a LARP? Is it something more than that? No, no, because the, the, the whole point of this is that, the, that it only works if there's a, a sincerity behind it and an earnestness in which it's uh, sort of experienced and taken on board. 
So with the amount of uh, significance that's built up behind it, then uh, it, it probably would have a, a very reverent quality to it. I know there's a, a, a I know that the uh, Last Supper table is often um, uh, depicted as a, a long table. Am I not right in thinking that that was actually more of a round table with one seat left for supposedly Judas at empty seat? And I know that the there is a segment on Arthur's table that supposedly has the same empty seat. Um, whether or not it, it's after in in uh, it, it, with that in mind, I don't know, to sort of commemorate the supper. I, 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 assume, I assume there's some sort of crossover there, I would imagine. Well, I, I think um, a natural crossover is, of course, the grail itself, isn't it? The grail is used at the Last Supper, and the, the Knights of Arthur go in search of it. Mm -hmm. And during Edward III's reign, so this is something we, we should probably talk about as well. So there's the discovery of Arthur's grave at Glastonbury. Glastonbury mm -hmm. tour or the the abbey there but one of the and we'll maybe we'll talk about that in a second but one of the things that's kind of emerges during this period is this idea that Arthur is descended from Joseph of Arimathea who was one of Christ's disciples in secret at first and then tends to the body of Christ after the crucifixion his kind of tomb is is given for Christ's body but legend had it that Arimathea came to Glastonbury and founded the abbey and gave them the Holy Grail. So there is this kind of, uh, and, and what's more than that, that Arthur himself is descended from Joseph of Arimathea. So there is this kind of strong uh, attempt to con connect him to somebody who has the relic from the Last Supper. So I, I definitely could see how uh, the table situation could tie into that as well. I know that there's, there's a, I don't know if you'd call it a conspiracy book, but there's a, one of these sort of uh, kind of Graham Hancock type books. I think it's called The Holy mm -hmm. Blood and the Holy Grail. Um, it's supposedly about the blood lineage of Jesus and Joseph and uh, talks about uh, maybe some, th this question of a kind of a, a, um, a lineage of nobility that is related to King Arthur. I forget who wrote it though. But I, I don't know if it's one of those books considered sort of pseudo history. But it's I, I remember reading it years ago. Nonetheless, it was quite fun. If people are interested in that, um, yeah. <laughs> it sounds interesting. It I'll sounds have to really find it. I will. I'll find it and post it in the, the comments. I'll do that. <laughs> yeah, please do. Please do. Um, so, so what? One of the other things. So the discovery of Arthur's body, or his tomb. This is quite important because we've been mentioning how many people believed Arthur himself would return at some point, at least in the, the uh, 12th century. But the, the, the suggestion in some of the scholarship that figures like Edward III would want to, to kind of emphasise that Arthur himself is dead, in part because Welsh uh, kind of uprisings were often founded or saw as a kind of focal point, Arthur. But they believed, no, we are different from the Normans. We are different from the English. And that just as Arthur conquered Britain, so we will conquer once again. We will rise up and reclaim our lands. So finding the body kind of puts to death this idea that the Welsh will have their Arthur and, and rise again. But nonetheless, you still see at the same time that they want to kind of present themselves as uh, a new Arthur or in the lineage of Arthur. So there's it's this kind of, there's a kind of tension there with finding the grave, but at the same time, uh, rekindling the, the culture for themselves. It, it seems almost contradictory, but it's, they managed to, to, to work through it. Well, one of the, one of the issues with that is that by my preliminary reading, um, the Welsh don't actually claim him until relatively late. So he, he shows up as a uh, relatively tertiary figure. And, and in terms of the, um, the the prince who is going to return their return their lands to them, they they prefer to they for a long time preferred to uh, associate that with with other features, not Arthur. It's something that only really comes about once Arthur has already gained popularity elsewhere. So it's kind of they're kind of late to the um, late to the party on that one. So he he is perhaps more of a um, a unified. Uh, Brit British figure 
than uh, than you're giving credit for there, actually. Well, I, I I wasn't trying to suggest that he he is exclusively of the Welsh. It, it was more that the the Welsh so uprisings trying were trying to present him in that way mm. as a distinctively Welsh figure. Um, but I, I think you're right because it wouldn't have been plausible for Edward to kind of present him as a British king if he if he wasn't or a, a king of the whole island, I should say. Um, if he was if he was just a Welsh king, he wouldn't have tried to adapt him further. He would have just discredited it. Um, so I, I think that's uh, um, I, I think you're right on that point. Let, let's move forward to Henry the seventh. Um, and of course, many many of us uh, who grew up in Britain will have studied something of the Tudors. Is usually one of the modules you get in history as a child, uh, and the War of the Roses and so on. Uh, but Rupert, could you kind of fill us in a little bit on the historical context and uh, how that relates? Henry kind of taps into the Arthurian uh, return narrative in during the Wars of the Roses. Yeah, so it's hard to to really know uh, specifically where he was drawing it from, whether it be his uh, Welsh ancestry. Um, Considering um, the Welsh at this time were trying to were trying to claim Arthur more particularly, um, even though as we just said he's he's kind of more kind of a more general British figure, or whether that was coming more from the um, Plantagenet side because obviously he had Plantagenet um, blood in him as well, hence the claim to the, hence his claim to the throne, um, and they had a long history as well of, of claiming Arthur for themselves and claiming to be a restored uh, claiming to be the uh, the restored Arthur in various forms. But one way or another, he decides to sort of jump onto that claim uh, very closely from pretty much from the very start. So when he when he's launching his bid during the War of the Roses to um, gain the the throne for himself, he actually uh, makes sure to take a detour via Wales and uh, parades through Wales after collecting the um, the banner of the, uh, uh, the the banner of the Pendragons, basically the uh, the Arthurian dragon. Um, and so that is actually one of his battle standards that he uh, that he takes with him to the Battle of Bosworth Field. This is, of course, coming at the end of the uh, the very extensive and very destructive Wars of the Roses, um, which had done, you know, pr pretty much incalculable damage to um, to Britain and the, especially the sort of power of the monarch. And as such, when Henry returns, he's able to sort of again present him much in the same way that Henry the Second did. Henry the Seventh is able to present himself as a sort of restored Arthur, and he leans very heavily into the uh, into the mythos to the extent that he actually and, and to the legend, legend in general, and presents a lot of his um, you know reforms and his re re-establishing of of order and royal power in quite explicitly Arthurian terms. And he actually goes as far as to name his uh, firstborn son Arthur, but uh, unfortunately, in that case, it's um, it doesn't really work out so well, and he uh, he ends up dying at the age of fifteen, I believe. He's actually that's um, right, yeah, yeah. He's actually he actually died quite close to quite close to me now in um, Ludlow, because uh, early on he was um, a he was made Lord of the Marches, and so there was almost like a uh, an additional kingdom to the realm that was that, that was sort of being crafted out, but it was uh, instead just reabsorbed back into the uh, throne of England. Is it also with? Um... Arthur's birth. I believe that the the uh, Henry uh, ordered that uh, he should be given birth in um, Winchester, which was typically believed to be one of Arthur's courts. I think it might have been Caer Leon, uh, or it might have been Camelot, but uh, one of those. So they were even trying to get him born in the place where Arthur was. So there was very strong <laughs> hopes for Arthur to be Arthur reborn, essentially. Yeah, and uh, well, I mean to to take it full circle. Then, in a way, when he was um, when he was buried, his his funeral was um, well at, at his funeral he was buried beneath the um, uh, the standard of Brutus of Troy, mm. who was obviously the uh, mythical founder of Britain and predecessor to the uh, the Pendragons, Arthur Pendragon. And of course, he himself civilizes the wild wastes of Britain during that period too. Uh, yeah. In that case, it's the giants, right? But it's the same. It's the same cycle of 
a wild time of anarchy and danger and threat, and then a king establishing order, civilizing, bringing peace to the to the realm and allowing civilization to flourish. Uh, and you can definitely see that with Henry's uh, defeat of uh, Richard III and also his marriage to Elizabeth of York. I think that's quite important. The, the formation of the Tudor Rose kind of symbolizing that it, it has a kind of um, it's, I mean, it's not strictly speaking Arthurian because mar the marriage with Guinevere isn't with an enemy king, but that idea of bringing through marriage peace to the realm and symbolizing it with a flower seems to speak in the language, a medieval language that would conjure up an Arthurian kind of uh, court context. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, other than that, um, although, I mean, the, the, the other sort of most important legacy of this period, I suppose, is the fact that all of this does take place in an environment where, um, once again, the, the Arthurian legend is, is enjoying a renewed um, popularity because it was only, I think it was only just a little bit prior to uh, Henry VII's ascension that uh, Thomas Mallory is doing his writing. And so a lot of his works in the, um, you know, the, you might call it the second or third, like major wave of the, of Arthur, of the Arthurian legend is, um, and the romances is sort of raised up in this Tudor environment. And it's very much popularized in the Tudor environment. And so you get a lot, you get a lot, like another generation of people who are, who are very much viewing um, their position in the world in these kinds of terms, in these kind of chivalric terms. Unfortunately, you might say that in that in that case, it didn't really come to as much of a um, honourable conclusion because um, it sort of leads to figures like Henry VIII, who view themselves in this kind of very knightly, um, very sort of chivalric way. But uh, ultimately, they don't really have much. Well, Henry VIII in particular doesn't really have all that much to show for it, other than um, you know a lot of a lot of debt from wars that didn't really yield much. No, no. I mean, I, I guess there is the ambition to be like a great conqueror like Arthur and to re-establish the French colonies or dominions. Uh, so that could be seen as an Arthurian trait. Um, but I, I do wonder as well, during this period, you, you're seeing, uh, and we've kind of spoken about this before a bit, that there's a there's a, a more mobility for um, the lower classes in some degree to have entrance into court in ways that perhaps before there wasn't. So I'm thinking of somebody like Thomas Cromwell, who uh, starts out, you know, the son of a, a some kind of craftsman, I believe, and ends up being uh, Henry VIII's right-hand man for a time, which strikes me as quite antithetical to the Arthurian ideal. Um, although it was quite possible for an, you know, an, a knight, if he proved his virtue through deeds, to become a member of the Round Table, it wasn't just like any old person could become a knight of the round table. There's still a social hierarchy here. It's only certain men of certain blood and valor who are capable of that. So I wonder if that, um, that too is also an erosion of the Arthurian ideal, which we'll see continues on after that period at quite oh. a rate. Yeah, unfortunately so. But um, I mean, perhaps you could, perhaps then it would be, uh, <clears throat> uh, well, some food for thought then perhaps the uh, the failure of his uh, of his full Arthurian restoration in the form of the you know the, the premature death of his son was uh, a repudiation of his methods then perhaps providentially speaking possibly yes yes I, I've, I've also wondered as well whether um because you know you have the death of Arthur you also have um, when James the sixth becomes James the first of Scotland his eldest son I think he was called Henry is that right? And uh, he was, you know, by all accounts, he was like the model uh, knight. He was a great sportsman. He was very generous. He was devoted and pious, but he was, a, he was a man of action, let's say, and he was destined to become king. But then he dies as a teenager as well. And it is Charles who becomes the, the king. And I can't help but see the parallels there in terms of Charles, you know, he had many strengths, but he also had many weaknesses and was never, wasn't, wasn't the firstborn son in, and I, so I just wonder if there's a parallel there too. Yeah, I mean that, that in itself is a, is sort of like a wider archetype. So I'm, mm. I also think of. Um, so I wrote a little bit on um, Nikolai Romanov, 
who was the um, older brother of Alexander III. This is much later, of course, but um, he was sort of widely loved and um, very widely respected. And he was considered at the time to be basically a model a model czar, but uh, he dies prematurely as well. And, uh, and so it falls to his brother, who is uh, much more of the sort of athletic, ath athletic type. Um, and uh, a lot of the family is, is, is sort of never quite the same after that loss. Hmm. Yes, that's that's quite interesting that that keeps cropping up, um, and it's it's almost like the Arthur that could have been is is taken away, uh, and you could maybe look at various past sins or whatever as being connected to that. But that that does seem quite interesting that at a moment where it could have an Arthurian character. So take the English context where you have the Civil War in in due course. Perhaps an Arthurian figure could have av avoided that situation or dealt with it. Um, in a way that was much better for the country than panned out. It's easy. It's easy to say that, isn't it? But it's it's just a thought that crops up in my mind when I think about this, the deaths of elder brothers in that regard. Well, it's the same with Arthur. I, I often think about mm. um, Arthur, especially as as he was quite an erudite figure. Um, whether he would have um, avoided the, uh, I don't know. I guess dip diplomatic and. Um, like the, the awkward situation that, that like the awkward pragmatic situation that Henry found himself in that caused the um the reformation. I, I struggle to think that would have happened under um under someone that was quite learned and um well he see, he seems to have been quite pious as well basically. So I basically basically I I imagine that an, an Arthur, even if he'd faced the same issues, would have been able to much better use his um you know diplomatic abilities in order to uh, skirt around the issue rather than having to use a blunt force tool like declaring yourself to be the uh, head of the church. It's a, it's a, it's a funny one though, isn't it? Because in the uh, original kind of stories, Arthur is in opposition to the papacy. So whether or not that, that did lend, lend itself to um, not, not full scale reformation, but uh, empowered somebody like Henry to see himself in that model. Uh, you know, using that aspect of the story. Yeah, one does wonder. I mean, but like we said earlier, there are, there are elements that are potentially uh, contradictory, and so it, it kind of depends on what is uh, relevant for the moment to pull out. Mm, that's true. That's true. Sh shall we move on then to the Victorian era um, in terms of it? Because I, I see that as, or, well, prior to and the Victorian era, the, the resurgence of Arthurian literature because you were commenting Rupert before the stream that after the Tudors there's there's almost a kind of um, desert when it comes to Arthurian literature there's no interest for several centuries until um, a certain moment yeah I, I mean um, this is one of the periods or the, well this is the period where you can kind of see the clearest what I've sort of tried to allude to earlier and when you have this sort of lull in interest and we can kind of see that actually playing out and, and get a pretty good record of, of not necessarily entirely what is causing it, but what it's coinciding with that perhaps gives you some indication as to what is uh, sort of undermining this approach. Um, and that's the fact that, so eight, eight years before the English, the outbreak of the English Civil War is when you get the first, or the last rather, uh, printing of, uh, like the last edition of uh, Thomas Mallory's uh, Le Morte d'Arthur. And after that, for approximately 200 years, uh, there is essentially no interest, no republications of, uh, of any Arthurian, like no new editions of Arthurian texts. Uh, obviously, at this point, it's not for lack of um, ability, it's just for lack of interest. And, and although there are sort of like um, inklings of interest here and there in the form of a, um, in particular, there was a an opera uh, that was written about uh, the Arthurian mythos in the Restoration era, I want to say. I, I believe it was like the 1680s or something like that. I can't, I can't remember the name specifically, but I, I can find it in a minute if necessary. Either way, in the in this period, there's a much much greater interest in other genres like satire, and the the kind of um, the cynicism and the, and the sort of deconstruction that is that is sort of accompanying a lot of this, which is you know arguably perhaps um, leading to certain uh, scientific discoveries when you when you get into sort of like the high enlightenment, the approach which is sort of leading one to um, embrace like sincere ideals, like chivalric virtues, 
uncritically is is something that that just can't survive that kind of uh, that kind of atmosphere. And so you get about two hundred years of no Arthurian literature, basically no no Arthurian material, and and almost no interest in it, basically, until you get to the French Revolution, and during and after the French Revolution, there's such an utter revulsion at what the project of enlightenment has seemed to be leading to in terms of all the bloodshed and all of the um, mob rule and, and all of the general chaos that's that's unearthed. There's a, a mass turning away, especially among the uh, aristocracy, from these kind of uh, enlightenment ideals. And so what you see is a rediscovery of all of these kinds of... Uh, you might say anti-enlightenment or romantic ideals, and the the period of romanticism is when you see much more rediscovery of all of the uh, medieval ideals in general, and, and like a, a turning away from from a lot of uh, enlightenment um, objectives, basically. And so that that naturally sort of accompanies a rediscovery and and then a, like a republication eventually of the various. Um, Arthurian works and all, all of the different romances. After that, it doesn't take too long before you get to people who are kind of tr trying to take these stories and then reimagine them in the, in the, in sort of like more in more contemporary terms. And that's when you get onto figures like Tennyson, which is how uh, quite a lot of people became acquainted with the Arthurian mythos in the uh, in the nineteenth century and into the uh, Victorian period. Yes, I, that's a that's a great summary, and I. I I kind of wanted to draw attention to just one or two things there in terms of the, you, you mentioned kind of the enlightenment and the, the kind of rationalistic approach um, in general to life uh, that would undermine uh, an Arthurian one that's, that is very much emotive. And I think you can see this in the, in the relationship to the, the kind of governance structure as well. That's implied by Arthur because Although it's bound to duty, it's 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 fundamentally oaths given between people, and this is a this is how the medieval world essentially worked. You pledged yourself not to an abstract constitution or institution, but to your lord, and you served your lord as you know above above all things. So it's an individual person, a concrete being, who you've pledged yourself to, and Arthur typifies that. It is his decision which goes, not some uh, kind of uh, creed, let's say. Or, and and it, he channels the transcendent through himself. Whereas after, uh, I, I would say after 1689, you're really seeing a system develop in, in Britain, a parliamentary system which does away with that idea. The king isn't that sort of figure anymore. He is a constitutional head who symbolically represents in various ways. And, and, and I know it's stronger than it has uh, has become, the role of the king back then, but it's still that kind of idea that it isn't really him that comes first. It's the system of precedent, legal precedent, and parliamentary decision. And parliament itself is a certain has a certain impersonality to it. You can exchange any of the people in there, and the system keeps on going. You pull out the king from the Arthurian system and the whole thing crumbles, as we've seen. So there's a difference between the personal and the impersonal system here. And that then ties in with this romantic idea of the recovery of emotion, of personhood, that we're not just autonomous individuals with rights. We're people in relation and we shouldn't be exploited as such. So I, th I think it really, um, what you said really hits the nail on the head as to why Arthur would, out of all the symbols that they could have drawn upon, why Arthur becomes that um, thing that's turned to during this period. It must be said, though, that uh, what a lot of the, uh, especially the later writers are interested in, it's not necessarily Arthur himself, but the uh, the kind of questing environment that, that uh, he finds himself in. Or, well, you know, that the, the knights find themselves in, um, because that is perceived as being much more relevant to the... Uh, the Victorian atmosphere by that point. So you know, you could say maybe that the the situation is uh, is already such that a 
an Arthurian type figure who was able to reestablish power in the same way that a Henry II or an Edward III had been able to, or a Henry VII, that that environment doesn't really exist anymore. It's not something that's that's feasibly on the table. Everything is too far gone. It's too corrupted. But what they do see is they they do look out over the world that is uncultivated, unruly, chaotic, uh, and they see like an endless expanse of, uh, of new horizons and new frontiers to go and uh, to go and c- civilize. And so that that is the primary occupation of the of the people who are raised on these kinds of stories, on these uh, on the on the, qu- the the tales of the questing knights. So you get figures like a Rhodes, like a, uh, a Chinese Gordon, um, and people like this who are who are going out and they're trying to civilize, you know, c- civilize the savage the savage world basically, and bring it bring it under under control and under under cultivation. Well, I remember um, actually uh, Prince Albert gave a speech at one point. I can't I can't remember when I'm afraid, but he essentially makes the case that through empire, through capitalism and through Christianity, which will be spread by the empire, that we'll be able to kind of uh, bring the world to its highest point ever in in terms of bringing civilization to all the peoples of the world. And as one, they will serve one God, one king, and have the highest prosperity ever. So there is this kind of sense in which for a figure like him, uh, he sees the empire as the agent of Arthur. Or, or in a sense, the great conquest um, that Arthur achieved can be achieved once again by the British Empire on a world scale, bringing about this perfect ideal uh, kingdom, almost. Yeah, exactly. And I, I definitely do see someone like a, uh, a Cecil Rhodes in this kind of, uh, in this vein, insofar as he's he's looking at uh, things like the like his, his Cape to Cairo railway, and it almost, it, it seems very crude to compare it to the, uh, the Grail quest, but it, it's it's interesting that uh, after the after the height of, of British power and when uh, everything is sort of is sort of already starting to crumble after World War One is finally when that that uh, that objective is fulfilled. Hmm. Only after World War One do they actually fulfill it. Again, like the previous, where with Arthur, it's the crumbling of the kingdom, then the Grail quest is complete. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the so the the. Uh, the quests of these various uh, of these various men is only is only actually brought to fruition. I mean, in in some sense, the world is civilized, but it's uh, it, it costs the kingdom, it costs the empire mm. to do it. Interesting, interesting. And th- and then yeah, at the same time, so you have this kind of imperial angle to it, which I do think very much fits with certain aspects of Arthur. <clears throat> Excuse me, but on the other hand, the kind of literary tradition at the time, somebody like Tennyson, who then influences the pre-Raphaelite brotherhood in terms of their art. I think of figures like John Ruskin, William Morris, who, I, well, Morris definitely taps into Arthur. Ruskin, it's more, and Carlyle, it's more kind of neo-medievalism more generally. But there is this sense in which they're trying to recover something which they feel industrialization has destroyed within the, within the country that the emphasis upon profit, on mass production, on uprooting communi- people from their communities and forcing them to work for pittance, the, un- the uh, wickedness of that has robbed the British, the English, of true being. And in some way, the recovery of Arthur, of seeing a, a prior mode of being or of life which is far greater in terms of serving the transcendent, of defending the weak and innocent, of allowing um, heroism to reign, of romance. This this kind of mechanical world flattens all of that out, and so they're trying to recover that through their literature and art. Well, romanticism itself... Oh, can you hear me okay? Oh, yes, I'm unmuted. Yes, Romanticism right. itself, really, as the name implies, it's invested in romance. And I think uh, maybe a sort of slightly more superficial point, but a, a valid one all the same, is really just the, as as romantics, it was the enchantment of, of medieval romance and the Arthurian tales, the world of sorcery and charms and spells that that lend themselves to a very solid and uh, desirable counter medium to, as Rupert was saying, the industrial revolution, the the latent impoverishment, the soot and the smog and the belching smoke and steel of industrial London, like you read in William Blake's poem in London and 
tiger, tiger burning bright. So the tales really suit, firstly, the kind of poetic allegorical practice itself, because all of the poets are in competition to draft the great epic. And Arthur really is the material of epics. So the tales suit that long form poetry in blank verse, but also, I mean, it's really John Keats. I, I saw um, Nathan the other day, you posted, wait, was it you was posting about La Belle Dame Sans Merci, John That's Keats's right, poem? Yeah which is of course full of, um, I, I think inspired by Edmund Spencer's The Fairy Queen, mm -hmm. but uh, very, very Arthurian. And of course, William Blake's illustrations such as Death on a Pale Horse. Um, you know, the Arthurian romances, I, I guess, I think they're probably the most singularly desirable and commercially popular uh, reoccurring medium in, in book, book print history, one of at least. And I think that's just because the legends make just for some of the most imaginatively and visually rich and, and, in, and aesthetically sumptuous for, for popular print. So Keats's mm -hmm. La Belle Dame Sans Merci and um, the Eva St. Agnes. Uh, you mentioned Ruskin, but also John William Waterhouse, John Everett Millet, Frederick Layton. They're all painting these beautiful, uh, wonderful paintings, especially Waterhouse. You see the, the gorgeous paintings of women with that kind of... Uh, these shimmering orbs or, or crystal balls, I guess, and witches and wizards. And I, I think that you see this a lot on tapestries and especially illuminated manuscripts. I think just the stories lend themselves so well to the, probably almost like that childlike love of wonder that you find in magic mirrors and wizards and glowing swords, shimmering orbs. And they always really suited the uh, just the physical form of a, of a manuscript, you know, the use of uh, cinnabar and gold leaf, emerald greens and bright blues, so really painstakingly crafted, ornately decorated bindings, uh, medieval illuminate, especially the illuminated manuscript, really suit the kind of regal courtly splendour and mythical beasts, giants and dragons, beautiful maidens and castle turrets and tales of war and conquest. And I think a, a question as to whether or not it, it comes in and out of fashion, I, I think it does, but there's a reason it's, we returned, there's always a renaissance of, of the medieval, oh, sorry, the Arthurian romance. Um, I think because like the fairy tales, we like to return to them time and time again. Uh, and, and Tennyson is probably really the first time the average reader could take or purchase their own lovely copy of the tales. Um, to take home in their pockets and enjoy by the fireside. And I don't think they'll fall out of fashion for this reason. Uh, some people think they're a bit twee and sugary sweet from that era, but I think they're very beautiful. You know, these sort of, uh, Hol is it Holman Hunt? And I forget who you, who you, you put, right, yeah. some pictures earlier on, on Twitter. Friends I just think they lend, lend really well to that, you know? Mm. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I mean, there's, there's an interesting point that you just uh, raised there quickly, and I, I think it's uh, sort of illustrative of the, the whole situation and, and perhaps where we are, because the sense in which we're being cynical about it and, uh, and you know, crit criticizing the forms and criticizing some of the earnestness in which it's brought along is, is again, illustrative illustrative of the fact that we're not there. We're not we're not in that kind of time that, that produces knights and heroes, uh, and only when when you get back to that place that's able to uh, be sincere and um, humble and, and open to these kinds of ideas is, is when you can actually start producing knights again and start producing the kind of uh, men who would go out on quests to the far ends of the world in order to just, um, you know, either bring civilization there or just to, just to see what's over the hill or, you know, just to fulfill some quest. I think you're both right. I, I do wonder with the Victorian kind of flourishing of it, whether there is a sense in which we could say, and, and I, I think this was very much your point, Dr. Ralby, in that the living conditions at that time were kind of drained of this enchanted life, not only due to the rationalism, which had done away with the kind of calendar of the year with Merry England and so on, and, and, and also with the kind of scientific reductionism to the material. But then, but then also kind of your working life is suit and smog and in a factory where you're not making things out of imagination and beauty, like the Gothic uh, architect or craftsman, but for monetary value. And it doesn't have any kind of higher meaning. And it's also exploitative. Whereas 
so so perhaps that those conditions were so drained of it that it found this kind of call or outpouring within the literature and it was so appealing because of that it, it was also almost this need which needed to be fed uh, and and you're right it's not just a, a kind of literary need it's aesthetic it's you could say religious to a certain degree that's being uh, supplied by this literature by this art um and why it's so powerful during this period i think and also very communal um mm. tales for the fireside you know, to cl classic communal uh, tales like the old Horatian Odes or um, the voyages of Homer and, and uh, the Odyssey. I, I think it's it's the communal uh, element to them too, which always is something that survives and um, a big part of a people's folklore are their tales that are told in, in groups. Do, do you think uh, as well that... See, see, see it's interesting that... From what I could find, there's a lot less emphasis on the return of Arthur during the Victorian era. That uh, I guess the exception might be, um, is it White who writes once and uh, the King wants him for the future as a as a novel, but like the pre-Raphaelites don't really engage with that concept. Um, you mentioned that it there's more focus on the knights and their adventures mm -hmm. to a certain degree. Is there a kind of sense that we're never going to get this back, or is it's a forlorn hope? It's a more a, a nostalgia for what's been rather than for what might be. Well, in that period, I mean, you have to remember they're on the precipice of the new a kind of new dawn, and and Wordsworth famously says, "Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive." There was always a feeling of being right on the precipice of, well, the the great era of industrial revolution, whether horrific or not they all i think they had such a steadfast sense of themselves impoverished and poverty stricken as they were um I, I wonder if this is the kind of thing that only tends to find revival when there's a general kind of maybe impoverishment of spirit maybe that's why there wasn't such a, an emphasis on the return of arthur because perhaps they didn't feel a longing for for that return at that point perhaps it only comes in times when the coming man is needed. I, I don't know, perhaps. Yeah, I mean, I, I would compare it to the situation of uh, Edward III. So in the case of Edward III, there was not a uh, kingdom that needed to be put back together per se. It was it was already more or less cohesive when he uh, when he acquired it. And so the the sense in which he was a restored Arthur is is slightly different to the one to the situation that was faced by Henry II and Henry VII. Um, so different, slightly different things were taken from it, and uh, you know, slightly different prerogatives were, were put were, were put in front of um, what a restored Arthur represented at that time. And I think it was the same for the uh, for the Victorians. They didn't necessarily perceive um, the country itself in the same kind of danger, just the the way of life more so. And so the the restoration uh, meant for them much more of a restoration of the spirit and the uh, the questing desire and the questing um, impulse and the uh, the recourse to heroism. But I, I think there is a, a perhaps more of a sense than we're giving credit to, or at least it's worth sort of illustrating just how bad it got, because I, th I think for them, for like for the people actually living through that, uh, that early industrial period and the, uh, the early urbanization, not only were they witnessing the horrors of the French Revolution, which, you know, deconstructed everything in front of them, but in many ways, England and Britain were more advanced on that path than the French were at the time. And so things had been even more deconstructed uh, in many ways in England than in, than in France. It just so happened that it didn't, that it wasn't accompanied by a, by the same, the same sort of political crisis, but it meant that in the, uh, in the very early 19th century, when the uh, romantics were in full swing, it, it, England was perhaps even more bereft than France was of, um, of like a, uh, an ethic, like a, an, an actual romantic ethic to draw upon. They had to, rebuild it much more completely. And they had to rebuild all those communities, all, the, all those uh, spiritual impulses and the, the communal culture and, and all of that sort of stuff. And, and they, the sense of heroism and the moving away from like purely, um, purely materialistic, purely commercial concerns. I wonder too, if perhaps uh, the fact that it's Victoria on the throne and not a, a man perhaps uh, prevents 
her from kind of taking on that Arthurian mantle to a certain degree. Um, if it if it had been a, a male monarch, would they have been more open to or more able to kind of inhabit that role and perhaps bring about greater change? That's really interesting because um, there's a lot of emphasis on the Lady of Shalott and Guinevere. I don't know if there's any crossover. I'd have to have to really look into it. But that that's an interesting point. They get a lot of a lot of airtime, if you like, in this period. Yeah, I wonder. No, that, that was that was quite deliberate, actually. They were part of the reason why they found the um, the Arthurian legend to be uh, and the romances to be so enchanting was because uh, they saw powerful women and they thought that that was something that uh, should be aspired towards. So they were deliberately picking up the uh, these these more uh, feminine, like strong feminine archetypes, and then uh, and running with them and trying to trying to explore those rather than what they saw as uh, a, a you know male dominance everywhere else. Another factor, and this is probably uh, more particularly to somebody like Rossetti. Uh, you know, you mentioned love earlier on, the romances, of course, and, and kind of chivalric love, and how there was in many traditions during that period, uh, the medieval period, there was certain kind of emphases upon in courtly love of devoting yourself to a lady. Um, she may be married to another man, but there is room for a kind of an illicit affair if true love is actually uh, emerges between the knight and the lady. And given these, these guys were looking for the lib what they saw as the liberation of love being key to the restoration of society. Uh, I think of like the young Hegelians and the young German movement and so on as well, where there's this kind of um, desire to liberalize sexuality because they see that as, key to overturning the oppressive social structure and then if you look at like Arthur and Guinevere and Lancelot and, and other kind of examples within the tales whether it lends itself towards that kind of perhaps more subversive message uh, within the the Victorian literature and artistic endeavor but it is also uh, worth mentioning just how how much they succeeded rather than just how much they mm -hmm. uh, sort of fell short of, of of what we might traditionally think of as a uh, restoration because although they weren't so focused on the uh, the royal element and they weren't so focused on arthur the the elements of like uh, the restoration of heroism and the questing culture and the uh, the civilizing impulse like i mentioned um those were those were achieved and you know, from this from this kind of like late late Victorian into early twentieth century period is is when we produce some of the finest men that uh, probably this country has ever seen. So it's worth celebrating their success as well as just mentioning where they fall short. Most definitely, and I think perhaps that's a good kind of point to to draw to maybe the final question I wanted to ask you both relating to Arthur, because. And it, we've kind of been touching on this throughout the current situation. And it's it's been suggested that we're not quite at the point where we could have an Arthur, because even if it, an Arthur came about, we would be too cynical or our culture is too degraded that we couldn't embrace him. But, uh, but I am wondering, you know, there's often talk of collapse or um, severe kind of problems ahead in the next... 20 30 years or so demographic collapse is one of them and whether or not we could be in a, a kind of anarchy again where an arthur could rise but I, i'm i'm almost wondering what do you what do either of you think will perhaps be the main emphases that might emerge in in the literature before that point concerned with arthur is there any aspects about arthur that you see that you think oh, that's the thing that will perhaps chime most clearly with 21st century british people um, I, because as we've seen, certain aspects of Arthur kind of come to the fore at different moments. I think restoring um, restoring the impulse um, and well, the, restoring the opportunities for glory and heroism is probably one thing, and restoring of the uh, the idea the, the ideal of the knight. I think that's something that is uh, completely lost in um, modern discourse, especially in terms of um, what is available to. You know, even even high achievers, even even what you might call a, a lowercase a aristocrat, 
um, there's really not that much opportunity for the same kind of uh, glory that was readily uh, and, and you know honor and, and virtue and that was readily available in uh, in the Arthurian time in the Arthurian times. So I think that's that's something that would re that would relevate uh, resonate. I mean, for a more general view, though, I would say probably order and justice. I think we are completely completely adrift from any sense of uh, any semblance of uh, justice. And so the idea of somebody being able to come and set things right again and and put the uh, put the country and the kingdom back on the right path is is something that would that would probably resonate the most strongly with the most united people. Just to actually see justice again. Daughter of Albion. Mm. I was remind. I'm just reminded by something that uh, Jonathan Bowden said. Um, he was once asked about Shakespeare and what a what somebody had asked him what working class lad today would, could ever relate to Shakespeare, having likely never read his work. And Bowden said that within every Englishman there is this innate pride in knowing that Shakespeare was one of the boys. So regardless of whether or not they could, the average Englishman or woman could name you a Shakespeare play or had ever watched one of his plays, um, they would they loved to know that he was an Englishman. And I think Arthur carries something of that same status of the immortal champion. He's one of the boys, to, to put it in Bowden's terms. Um, so if anything would resonate with people, I think it's it's, it's that love of knowing he was an English lad. You don't have to know anything about the kind of lofty uh, code of chivalry or the regality of the court. But to know he was he had English blood, I think, is something that there is a, a real thirst for. And um, you, Rupert, you, you just used the word adrift. And I think earlier on, I, I wrote it down because I thought it was a really nice phrase. You, you mentioned this desire to correctly orientate again um, what we've lost. And I, I suppose that would be it. I, I'd say, you know, in this time of, of great degradation, there is a real thirst and hunger for for the coming man, so to speak, to, to correctly orientate us again. I, I think there's a readiness for that, for sure. So I I, I think it's, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to see the, the myth revived, if you like. I think now's a good time. Uh, one of the boys, as I say. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> I think those are both excellent ways to put it. And there's very little that I would want to add. Um, I, I guess I guess one question would be then, uh, and this kind of taps into something that you mentioned at the beginning, Rupert, but I think it'd be good to address it again, is we've kind of seen throughout that at some stages, the idea of Arthur's return, a literal return was believed in, that people genuinely thought that this was going to happen. But other times, certain people kind of take on that mantle, they they inhabit that role, but there's still this idea that perhaps Arthur himself will come back as this immortal figure. Now, we, like the Victorians, perhaps even more so than the Victorians, live in an age of materialism, the disenchantment of the world, the radical impact of secularism upon society. Most people, you know, there might be some kind of popular folk beliefs about ghosts and so on, but in general, most people wouldn't describe themselves as religious anymore who are British. So, you know, how then does that fit in with the kind of bringing back Arthur? Because in part, and I'm not necessarily saying we have to believe he'll literally return, but it is very bound up with kind of, um, well, well, you, you said it, Daughter of Albion, an enchanted world, a world like Middle Earth. That's kind of part of who Arthur is. Indeed, that's part of where Tolkien gets it from. And so I, I just wonder is, you know, in this age, is that kind of implausibility to most people a, a big barrier to this? Well, look how many times people revert to Tolkien. I always see people sharing that, even as a meme, you know, um, that moment in where Gandalf says to, to the hobbit or he looks at him and says you know um i wish this did not I wish the ring had not come to me and he says so do all who li live to see such, such times uh i don't know the regularity of the 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 number of times i've seen that shared i i think it there's a maybe kind of i just have to look at how often people i don't i don't think so at all i guess is what i'm saying i think it transcends that <laughs> 
Oh, well, Rupert, think, you go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I think I think even in the midst of uh, a great deal of cynicism and uh, I don't know irony, post irony, all of the uh, the deconstruction, there's still some appetite for something that is uh, sincere um, and honest and and real and believed in, and so I think um, there's a great tendency for cynical movements and deconstructive movements to sort of burn themselves out to some degree you you can mm -hmm. kind of reach the end of what can be deconstructed and uh after you've deconstructed your deconstructions what what do you really have left at that point you have to start believing in something perhaps uh, and so what better what better thing than uh, than stories that that have not only brought so much to previous generations but are also deeply embedded into uh, into your culture i couldn't agree more with both of you uh, I think I think you're totally right that people want, you know, what's the the buzzword often is authenticity. That's what people are looking for, and uh, when people find somebody authentic, they kind of latch on. And certainly with a movement, that's also the case. Um, so so I I totally agree with you on that. And then I mean, also one thing, one thing I add there that's <laughs> that's interesting to point out is um, that even in uh, so. Even in the likes of World War One, part of the reason why so many men were willing to sort of throw themselves into that so readily was, um, and especially intellectuals, which uh, you know you'd perhaps find surprising um, in, in a modern intellectual climate, but there was that that desire for um, community and authenticity and and getting around all the all the cynicism and all of the the triteness and the the superficiality of uh, of their present you know their their modernity, uh, and so. Although they were burned in that instance, the impulse never goes away. It never really goes away. You'll, they'll just keep looking until, and we'll all just keep looking until we find something that is that is real and something that we can grasp onto, and something that actually gives us strength. I think that's absolutely right, and it it kind of ties into something that I think Dr. Valbian was saying. You know, there's, there's it's almost like um, we we have our lives are kind of being lived through this very. Uh, shallow outer casing and there's things within us that are always trying to break through and the mythological the legendary the the lord of the rings being a good example of this people find such joy in that imaginative world filled with enchantment that seems to seep out into our real lives and when it does it's one of the most beautiful things but the the kind of modern ideology that modernism totally deracinated from time and space and tradition and culture tries to suppress that but more and more it breaks through and i think i think uh, you know you mentioned balden earlier he talks about getting beneath our inner liberal there's a sense in which we need to get beneath and when that happens uh, it's it's not just a number of ideas or feelings that we have there's a sense in which we're tapping into something much larger than ourselves in terms of community in terms of history in terms of perhaps metaphysical realities too, so I think um, I think uh, on the surface people resist it, but actually deep down there is there's a there's a kind of intuitive uh, subconscious connection there, which really uh, rouses people. And perhaps the best example of this was actually with the Queen's funeral and the King's coronation. There was people crying in the streets when the queen died and they had never kind of ever thought about her in that way before or felt that strongly about her but you know british men bursting into tears at the thought that their monarch had died and the media tried to spin it as oh they were crying because of her life of service or something like that but it seemed much more the case no it's the queen of england died and then when the king was crowned it was there was all these celebrations and people felt very strongly about it again not on a kind of rational level, it was just an impulse. And to that point, once once those barriers have been broken down enough, um, then there is there is scope for a, a you know a flesh and blood man to actually reemerge mm -hmm. as as a kind of Arthur figure. You know, think of all the uh, all the good men that you know. I'm sure there's I'm, I'm sure all of us could could name some of them. Um, and then uh, take the best of the best of those. Um, and it becomes quite clear to see how uh, someone who's been burnt too many times by by all the cynicism and all of the uh, all the material materiality, who it, it's easy to see how how, how people could uh, fall in behind a man like that of uh, of good qualities and great will and um, 
and much virtue. Most definitely. I totally agree. I, th I think that's a good place to kind of bring our Arthur discussion to close. And what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read uh, the super chats that we've got throughout this conversation. And then um, after that, we have some time for Q&A, uh, a bonus Q&A, because this is the finale. It could be on the topic that we've just had. It could be on something else entirely, something to do with English restoration or some other matter that's kind of relevant to this to this channel on uh, mythology, philosophy, politics, religion, etc. And uh, Rupert, DOA, you're welcome to stay as long as you want. Um, I appreciate uh, it. It depends how, how many questions we get as well. But uh, yes, we'll do that. Cool. I'll, I'll stick around. I might just have a, a ladies bathroom break quickly there, if you'll excuse me. <laughs> no problem. I'll do the super chats while you're gone. So um, first up, thank you to Amory Blaine for £4.99 sterling. Very much appreciated. Thank you for all your work. An extremely cosy channel. Your talking streams with Apostolic Majesty are some of my all-time favourites. Best of luck for the future. Thank you, Amory Blaine. I do really appreciate that. Um, that was a long time ago. I think that was a few years ago I was I did those streams with uh, Apostolic Majesty. They were at the very kind of start of uh, the channel. And yeah, those were really great streams. Uh, we went through the entire Silmarillion in depth uh, and uh, tried to draw out some of the connections and influences. And yeah, I think that's some of the best work I've, I've ever done on YouTube. So I'm, I'm glad that you you found them valuable too. It's, uh, it's, um, I think the last time I had AM on was <laughs> we did Breaking Bad, uh, <laughs> over Christmas. Um, oh no, that's not right. There was the talking quiz as well. Um, but I hope he's doing okay. I've not managed to stream with him for a while, but, uh, hope he's all right. Uh, am I right in saying, Rupert, that you, you were on his channel recently for, um, for a stream? Yes. I've been on a few with, uh, well, covering, um, Late Imperial Russia and uh, the Stalin era. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Because I believe he was coming to the end of a, a, a long series on that kind of topic. Yeah, one that I'd followed quite closely, funnily enough. So. Yeah. Well, I can't imagine uh, many other topics that you would be more perfect for, Rupert. To be honest, <laughs> uh, <laughs> your knowledge of Russia is quite is quite amazing. I don't. I don't. Uh, I don't know if you remember, but I believe that's actually the first thing we talked about when we first met. That's right. Yes, the Russian Revolution and um, about was it about the Secret Service? Is that right? Yeah, secret societies and uh, Neokrana, all that good stuff. Mm -hmm. See, see, I can't wait for your channel to to come back to life, Rupert. The world needs to know this stuff in more detail. Uh, but yes, yes, uh, Am great guy. Everybody should go and check him out too. Thank you, Amory Vlee. Uh Ben Wheeler for ten dollars thank you very much i wait for arthur's return just as i will wait for yours but above all i wait for christ's return in glory well so do i my friend and that will be the ultimate redemption when he comes so all, all of these other ones are temporary at best and I, I i do wonder if that's partly why uh you have that kind of tragic aspect in arthur that you know there is the perfect Kind of moment of the round table is a time of justice and order but like everything in this life it will fall at some point and that would be true of you know if a great man comes comes to fruition he may establish order hopefully for many generations but it will fall it's only with christ that there will be uh the true marriage of heaven and earth so these are, I guess they're all, the, um, what would you call them, Rupert? Is it like typology, signs of Christ? Is, is that the idea? As well? Yeah, I mean, uh, some kind of imitation. I mean, we, we did mention briefly before the, uh, the idea of Arthur in some ways mirroring Christ. And I think that is relevant, uh, except insofar as uh, Arthur obviously falls short. Because, mm -hmm. you know, of, of course, he can't can't reach full perfection. Yes, yes. And and also it's... it's um, you know, if you look at like the Lord of the Rings, for example, like Aragorn, Gandalf, and Frodo are all uh, kind of mirrors of Christ, but different aspects. And I guess Arthur like fits fits that too. He's a certain aspects of Christ he reveals, but it's not like the fullness of Christ. 
yeah, it would be only Christ the King. Mm -hmm. So speaking of uh, of Aragorn, actually, I, I should have mentioned this. I did think that actually Tolkien's presentation of what like Aragorn's return to Gondor, and you know, he over he overcomes the um, Sauron. Uh, well, he helps lead the fight against Sauron. He reestablishes the kingdom, brings about order. That's probably like one of the best depictions of what it might be like if you had such a figure returning. And the absolute joy of the people at that prospect of the prophecies coming true. Um, and it, that speaks again to what you're saying. That it takes a certain type of people to to kind of get on board with that. But that mm. that depiction is quite powerful, I think, of... of if you, if you were to take Aragorn as a kind of type of Arthur, then uh, it, it's probably the closest we can feel that way at the moment. Yeah, I mean, on, on that point, um, I was actually going to... Th there was a point I was going to make about it because, uh, you know, quite famously, Tolkien didn't really uh, think that the English had a, 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 like a proper mythology behind them like so many other cultures did. But uh, I have to disagree with him on that because I think that the, the Arthurian legend is... Uh, is probably one of one of the strongest mythoses out there, and uh, and it's something that has very very real power, as we've been discussing today. It's something that accompanies a uh, a reinvigoration of of the British people, especially because he's got accompanied by a kind of band of brothers, you know, with with his hobbits and his kind of menagerie of um, troops, if you like. I guess they're sort of our knights of a sort, aren't they? Yeah, that's a great comparison. Yeah, I think that's right. And actually, when they go back to the Shire, you know, there's the scouring of the Shire, uh, Sharkies, ruffians have taken over. What does Frodo say? It's like, open the king's road. It's all in the name of the king that they're acting, um, although they're coming back to the Shire. Yeah, so it is very much this kind of, like, mirrors the knights doing Arthur's will. Uh, yeah, it's quite interesting. <laughs> but I think, somebody, I think should, are... somebody should do a study of that sometime. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you are right about uh, probably giving one of the most uh, plausible and probably at the same time dramatic um, versions of a uh, of a return in the form of Aragon. That is, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, a good point. Thank you, mutant number twelve, uh, for four ninety nine dollars, sending power to your future endeavors. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind. 99 Iron Duke, good friend of the show and has excellent streams of his own, uh, where he looks at history and you know, British uh, history and culture and so on. Uh, please don't stay away too long, Nathan. We need good Englishmen and Britons more than ever today. That's very true. And uh, I am very open to returning. Uh, we'll see. We'll see where the spirit takes me. But thank you very much for your, your five Australian dollars. Much appreciated. Reto Hena Hanna, I, I apologize for my pronunciation. For five, what, what's CHF? Does anyone know? Um, let's see. Swiss franc, I believe. Five Swiss francs. Thank you very much. I do wonder why the sleeping king slash hero is so widespread. Over here, William Tell is sleeping under Mount Rigi with two other Tells. It's complicated. Well, wh why do you guys think that the sleeping king is such a a common archetype? And and it, there's other examples in Britain as well. You've got uh, Finn MacQuail in Ireland. You've got uh, Bran the Blessed in Wales. I think there's even kind of hints of uh, Robert the Bruce for Scotland. So why why do you think that is? I think there's also. Um... Alfred the Great. I think there's there's a version for Alfred, Alfred the Great. Alfred the Great. Well. Yes, that's right. Um, probably the most one one of the most uh, renowned ones is um, uh, the Marble Emperor in uh, Constantinople. The last uh, the last Constantine. I think it's Constantine the Eleventh. Uh, but there's also Barbarossa. Barbarossa is an interesting one, especially in terms of like um, his uh, his names. Well, you know his his namesake in the uh, 20th century. You know the idea that he uh, sort of like rises up again to protect the Germans in their uh, in their hour of need. I don't know. What, yeah, yeah. I, I don't specifically know why. Um, I guess I'd be open to open to theories. If you if you know of anything, if you can think of anything. 
<laughs> I'm trying to think off the top of my head, which is always I mean, a the, dangerous idea. Yeah, the, well, the only thing that comes to mind is uh, is basically just that there's some there's some amount of truth truth to it. So you know, maybe maybe similar to similar to the idea of um, uh, perennialist, you know, ide ideas around like um, mono mono myths and things like that. The the idea of the return is. Uh, Kind of some kind of echo or, or shadow or like pointing gui guiding people gradually towards um the return of christ i i think i think there's probably something to that i think you can also look at the idea of the cycle so this this sense of and we see that with the the seasons so winter is overcome by spring and so there's a sense of return with that and if the king the axis mundi the the figure who ties heaven and earth is is part of that order well then the coming of spring is seen as kind of tied to the coming of the king so there's always a kind of sense of return with that i wonder too though and maybe i'm pushing it too far with this but i i remember i remember thinking about nietzsche's the birth of tragedy and his idea of the kind of apollonian and the dionysian uh kind of attitudes towards towards the world and <laughs> We don't have to go into all of it now, but I guess one of the things he was saying was that the greatest form of art in Greek tragedy sees the sees the tragic in life as as kind of the brute fact, which then works its way out into all of the rest of the culture. So the suffering of Oedipus, this noble individual who's who uh, really of he tries to avoid his fate but cannot, and is dragged down into shame, pain and ultimately into disgrace this is kind of the the tragic greek view of the world and there's a sense in i almost think in which these these kind of return ideas are saying no ultimately that doesn't win out that isn't the final kind of thing to be said actually even though Euratha is fatally wounded there's something greater which triumphs in the end uh, maybe that's the apollinian spirit speaking uh any thoughts yeah he calls that the um the fraternal bond of a apollo and dionysus and through that he determines mm. that life can only be justified as an aesthetic phenomenon which there's a the search to unpack in that funnily enough just you said the name nietzsche i was just thinking as well of um his theory of or his his conceit of the eternal return where he says that eternally rolls the wheel of being um, everything dies, blossoms, and eternal again, and eternally runs the year of being. So I, I, I don't know. I suppose the idea of the eternal return, life is the kind of perpetual cycle of that that return. Uh, very Nietzschean, actually, ideas um, in in terms of Arthur as well. And yes, you're quite right. Apollonian, Dionysian tragedy, um, both chaos and order. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you, Reto, for your for your question. Led us off into Nietzsche, which is quite fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Master Crafter for five pounds. Here's a small gift as a thank you for the insightful videos. That's very kind of you. I very much appreciate your gift. Uh, and I will try to put it to good use. And our final super chat for now, the English Loyalist for $9.99. Thank you very much. The answers are within you, so don't despair. I already had guard and protect some Anglos here, so much work to do. This was a good stream. I always enjoy hearing about Arthur and the myths. Well, thank you, kind sir, and thank you for doing your bit as well in in trying to help other people to reach kind of those those deep things within them that need to be let out once more. Perhaps that is that Dionysian spirit in an Anglo form. Uh, I, I have kind of been thinking about that with that uh, with Wagner too you know he he's he's often talking about getting below the his conscious mind and letting the unconscious intuitions burst forth and i mean he's he he is a um a culture and race realist i guess Wagner so he believes that it's going to it's not just like a generic spirit it's going to be those intuitions which you have are going to be distinct to your people your kin your culture um so it's going to going to lead to the rebirth or renewal of your people if you do that um which i guess is a bit different different from nietzsche um 
but that is it's quite an interesting way to think about it. it it kind of makes sense of the idea that these things are within you and not just in a universal sense um so yes thank you the english loyalist let's see so now we have some time for questions so if you have any questions please feel free to put them into the chat um while we're waiting for questions to come in uh this is a good chance for promotions again so uh, rupert would you like to promote uh things that you're doing at the moment yep so as i said earlier i'm uh planning to restart my channel hopefully very soon <clears throat> um i'll be talking about uh, monarchy at first but uh, i'll probably end up uh, sort of going back into um, previous topics that I've talked about on uh, on various streams, like uh, revolutions, counter-revolutions, secret societies, and uh, and some of that's kind of uh, esoteric history that is not necessarily so often talked about, but I think is very, um, very significant and influential. Mm -hmm. Pro probably providing some kind of a definitive uh, take rather than the sort of bits and pieces I've scattered around here and there on streams. You're trying to collate a lot of what you've been saying, I guess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That'd be really good, I think, because it's uh, it, it, it's a difficult thing as well, because there's so many topics that um, like one idea might come up in, uh, which could connect in. But so bringing them all together and synthesizing them could be, I think that would be really helpful for people. Um, because as much as I want everybody to watch all the episodes in English Restoration, I appreciate that that's going to take a while. So I think I think that would be a, a, an invaluable service just in relation to your own work, Rupert. Um, Daughter of Albion, I know you said you're on hiatus uh, for a little bit, but if you if mm. and when you do return to making videos, is there is there any hints mm -hmm. as to what that might be? Well, hopefully just till around Christmas. So, um, and then I, I've got, you know, I've constantly got all sorts of ideas. I kind of fluctuate between sort of hardcore politics, but also always drawn to the cultural stuff as well. Mm. Um, I really don't know. I'm sorry, I can't tell you, but I, I am really itching to get back to it properly. I just feel like I can't really justify. It, it's, it's. I, I try and sling together half uh, half ass videos and I, I don't I just don't release them because I don't feel good about them so I thought mm. well okay I'll square away what I need to get done for now at um, IRL and then hopefully around Christmas time get back to it so but uh, I'm really looking forward to your, your revival of your uh, channel Rupert and obviously Nathan uh, excited to hear what you get up to on your hiatus but yeah other than that I'm afraid it's just a bit of a question mark at the moment but I will I will return you know uh, not as glorious as Arthur but I'm, I also may have to slip away now as well, if that's okay. No problem, Dr. Falbian. Thank Not you for late. joining us. It's been Thank great. You so much. But I'm going to listen to the questions. I'll be listening here. So, awesome. Uh, so, does anything mean about me? <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> You're very okay. welcome. Thank you for joining. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye for now. So, we, we have uh, a couple of questions coming in. Um, here we go. Crack Willow. What are your thoughts on the Fairy Queen by Spencer? Been reading as part of a book club alongside The Romance of the Rose. Must confess, I'm not very familiar with it. Um, Rupert, do you have anything to kind of say on this? Regrettably, no, I don't really have much to say about that either. I almost feel like uh, DOA was the perfect person to answer this question, and she's <laughs> just left. So I am sorry, Crack Willow. Um, that we can't be of more more uh, assistance, but maybe you could put another question in that if if there's anything specific in there that we could relate to something else. Um, but yes, is that is that's great though that you're reading it. I think um, you know reading these older texts is invaluable. Um, in some ways, as much as I love the Victorian literature, I, I do think it's it's wonderful. Re returning to prior ages where they deal with these topics is in some ways. There's a there's a there's an even greater degree of sincerity to an extent, um, just because they actually kind of inhabit that enchanted world. So even if they don't, um, even if they don't believe like the story literally, they do believe in fairies, for example. Uh, so I, I do think that brings a different dynamic to maybe some of the later stuff. 
kind of tying into what you said, Rupert, about sincerity. Um, Emrys the Elder. Uh, perhaps I should do a stream to get more men knitting into sock, into knitting socks and pickling cabbages. That sounds like an excellent idea, Emrys. I like it. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure it'll get uh, get the whole DR into to knitting socks. That would probably be an encouraging step forward. Lady of Shalott, good friend of the show, appear, appeared on the show as well when discussing William Morris and John Ruskin. Uh, thank you for wishing me for all the best. I very much appreciate it, and uh, we'll be we'll be we'll be in touch. I'm sure. Uh, Burnsy. I'm not sure how much you can speak of your upcoming endeavor, but how is your gut feeling for the future? Have you set any goals for yourself? Uh, excellent questions, Burnsy3210. I think, I mean, uh, there's a there's a there's a kind of basic premise to to what's in in my future, which is that you know I, I've done a lot of discussion of heroic figures. Even tonight, we've been talking about King Arthur. The need for sincere individuals, for, for people who devote their lives to to that thing which they believe in, who are then a, a ben of benefit to the to the rest of the community, to the to the nation, to the world more broadly. And I've often felt that although I I kind of put forward these ideas, I share them and I, I urge people to them, and I think that's a good thing. I I am not yet on the path myself to that and so i i'm going to take time to open myself up to that and to find out my vision what path that is for me and with that i i haven't kind of set any goals then because i don't want to prescribe it in that way i don't want to curb what might be a the avenue that i'm meant to go down uh, so so to that end that's kind of the larger project at the moment, I think uh, so. Some kind of things have happened so far, which are quite exciting, and uh, I, I think are promising avenues. It, it's it's hard to explain in some ways, but I, I, I primarily I, I have had a, a reawakening to what it means to participate in the life of the Trinity. That sounds very mystical and uh, probably a bit airy fairy to some people, but it it's just how it feels. And I think whatever, whatever comes forward from that, what, whatever direction I go, it's probably, that's going to be the foundation stone now in a way that it wasn't before. So that's probably uh, as much as I can really say at the moment. Uh, but yes, thank you, Bernsey for your, for your question. Um, Samuel Westlake. This may be a project for our computer programmer friends, but it may be sensible for your videos to be archived. Cannot lose all this. Well, if anybody wants to archive my stuff, please get in touch and we can chat about it. I'm, I'm happy for for that. Um, or to for or for it to be like on a Discord server or something like that. I, I don't know what how you do it, but. Uh, yeah, sure. I mean, I'm not planning to delete the channel anytime soon, um, but it, you know, there might be certain videos which it would be good to to have saved nonetheless. Particularly like the English restoration ones, I think that would be a good idea. Um, let's see. Vingle tried to send a super chat, but it didn't work. No worries, Vingle. Uh, if you have a question, just feel free to put it in the, the comments. Uh, maybe you're putting something in there which is uh, not allowed. Sometimes they can be a bit funny if you put a word that uh, is forbidden. Um, let's see. Uh, the English Loyalist has a question. Do you recommend any good books on Arthur? Rupert, any suggestions? Uh, yeah, my, my main, suge main suggestion would just be to... Uh actually read all of the originals and just just uh mm -hmm. get the same experience basically that uh, that everybody else was so read joffrey of monmouth read uh mallory read tennyson and uh anything beyond that is you know pretty much just supplementary couldn't agree more i think that's that that would be a good answer um 
I'm trying to think. I think Tolkien did write something on Arthur, you know. Uh, let me see. I mean, to, to uh, some extent, it, it also depends on which uh, which angle you want to take. So a lot of mm. people go down the line of uh, trying to figure out exactly who Arthur was and, uh, you know, what did he do exactly? When when did he live? Where did, where did he rule? And all that kind of stuff. And you can do that. Uh, and there are people around who have, uh, who have written on that. So in particular, mm. um, is it actual Aurox on Twitter? Yes, yes. He's he's done a lot of work in that uh, in that kind of sphere of trying to track down a, a concrete timeline and, and things. So uh, you could just go and look at his sub -st sub stack if you can find him, and um, and that that'll get you quite a lot of the way if if that's something you're interested in. But if you're just looking at uh, trying to sort of unlock what the what was resonating with uh, previous generations that led them to do what they did, then um, you're more just looking at reading reading the original materials and the romances. If you were looking to visual material, what do you make of the film Excalibur? Have, have you seen it, Rupert? Oh, I think I have, but such a long time ago that I don't really remember it very vividly. Because <laughs> I, I saw it quite recently, and I don't think it's like the best cinematic... Like, as a film, it's not the best film. But as a, just a straight telling of the Arthur story, it merges a few things together. But in general, I think it's quite faithful, or it tries to be faithful. So if you wanted just like a general overview, if you've never encountered Arthur before, then I'd actually recommend that film as a, a decent starting place. Um, of course, it's not perfect, and uh, there's certain limitations to a, a film as opposed to a book. But I think it's a good... It, for, the, for the modern individual, it might be a great, a great place to start given our visual kind of um, culture and so on. My memory didn't rate it very highly, so maybe, maybe I should uh, go back and give it another watch. I, as I say, I don't think it's like a... For me, it wasn't like a, a great film. So if you're watching it just like as a film, then it you know you might be a bit disappointed. But if you're thinking from an Arthurian perspective, thematically, and I think it quotes a number of times uh, from, our, from the Arthurian stories as well, so it and it and it has the music of Wagner in the background often as well, which I I really appreciate. Um, but uh, maybe that's I don't know. Is that appropriate? I think it's appropriate. <laughs> I don't think it's too distorting the the meaning of the uh, the music. Um, let's see. Ninety nine Iron Duke. Uh, please stay in the Discord for if when you decide to return. I, I'm not planning to leave Discord, and if people want to get in touch with me, that's a good point. I, I am planning to deactivate Twitter for a while as well, but you can find me on Discord, so if you uh, want to get in touch or want to stay in touch, uh, just just get in contact there. You can find me in 99 Duke server, so that might be a good way for people to find me, uh, or on the Lambda Bible Study server, so yeah, that's that's an easy way to do it. So I won't be leaving there. Uh, any more questions? Oh, uh, Vingle says that um, Tolkien wrote The Death of Arthur, which is a retelling of the story in a poem form, and translated Sir Gawain and the Green Knight. So even though he wasn't a massive fan of Arthur, he still, he still uh, engaged quite thoroughly with him, which I find interesting. Uh, let's see. Uh, yes, uh, Burnsy, if you find 99 Iron Duke's uh, Discord, I hope he doesn't mind me shilling his Discord. Um, but uh, uh, yes, you could. I, let me see if I can find the name of it. Um, the Anglosphere, very appropriate. Lots of top content in there. Lots of good guys. Lots of information about other streams as well. That's one of the things I really appreciate about, appreciate about 99 Iron Duke's uh, Discord is if you're like looking for a place where a number of um, streamers, like videos are being, um, like you have a notification about them, he'll put them in there. Uh, so you, you don't have to miss any of the good stuff uh, online. So that, that's really helpful. And uh, Rupert's in there too, uh, so that double reason to join 
join the uh, the Discord. Yes, yeah, very good company indeed. Uh Vingle says it's actually the fall of Arthur, not the death of Arthur. Uh, we'll get we'll give it a couple more minutes, Rupert, uh, for any further questions. Uh, I appreciate we've been going for a while, so people might be getting a bit tired, uh, their brains slowing down a little a little bit. Um, do you have any questions for me, Rupert? Anything you'd want to ask? Could be anything. Oh uh, yeah, when are you going to be back? Oh, uh, <laughs> I knew you would say that. Uh, I guess. See, because I, I'm trying to open myself up to the will of God, I don't know any like when I'll be back or in what form if I come back. So, yeah, I want I want to say yes, I'll be back after the summer. Like I do feel that could be possible, but uh, I just don't know yet what's meant for me, and I don't want to kind of tie myself down to coming back and then letting people down by not coming back or whatever. So um, I don't, there are some things that I might still be involved with, even if I'm not like fully back. Um, there there are some things kind of behind the scenes that uh, I won't be kind of just abandoning and you might see some of them coming soon. There's also some other projects which uh, uh, more kind of artistic projects that I might be involved with that uh, you might see in the next year or so. But again, I, I couldn't give a date on any of those. Uh, I, sh I should say as well, though, uh, while, while we're going to, because it's related to this, uh, what I might be involved with. Um, next week, I believe it is, in London, a number of artists in our community are um, coming together. They're going to present their work at the exhibition. And it should be a really great event. Uh, I'm going to go down. I know a number of other folks are going. Uh, Rupert, are you going to be able to make it? Uh, I'll definitely be able to make it down at some point. But whether we uh, head down, whether we're there at the same time may not yeah. necessarily be the case. But yeah, no, I wouldn't miss it. Well, yeah. And I think that's the thing. Like, So many people are going to come to this. It's going to be, I think it's like the first seeds or the first kindling of a of a great fire that could be that could um, be a really exciting cultural scene and movement, a real attempt to reinvigorate the arts within, uh, you know, our, our cultures. So I'd encourage everybody to go to that if they can, um, even if, you know, it's, uh, it, it's um, a little bit of a distance because it's one of those things that don't, doesn't come around very often. And we're constantly trying to get things in real life from this, from YouTube, so I think I think that would be that's something that's really special, and I'm really excited about it. Um, I think there's a stream on Thursday on Pharaoh's channel about it. If you want to find out more, um, Pharaoh, who was on here a, a few weeks ago, so go and check that out if you want more information. Um, let's see, uh, got a few more comments. <laughs> Um, right, Honourable Fez. Uh, good to hear from you again. And I, I, I somewhat expected this question to a certain degree. What would Max Weber say about King Arthur? Um, <laughs> this is in reference, I think, to the fact that many, many months ago, I did a stream on Weber's analysis of politics, uh, the different political systems that had emerged throughout history, and he had kind of divided them into the charismatic, the traditional, and the bureaucratic. And I think I kind of alluded to this earlier in the stream, but not very explicitly, that Arthur is a charismatic leader in the sense that uh, authority is invested within himself. It is his character, it is his vision, and it is his deeds which underpin the political order flowing from Camelot. And people act not on the basis of uh, kind of a priori rules, but because Arthur, their king, has commanded them to do X, Y, and Z. Whereas what we live under today, Weber would largely call a bureaucratic system, where we have a number of officials who have no ownership of the institutions, but nonetheless administer for them 
they get a wage, they operate according to uh, a priori rules, maybe that's the law, maybe it's custom, so on and so forth. But in those positions, they, ad they administer um, for the well-being of the system rather than for any service to a higher ideal. And uh, it, it does allow for advancement within this civil service or bureaucracy, but there's no place for the, the kind of individual's authority, the charismatic king or prophet. So I think Weber would see him as a charismatic figure who, um, um, I don't know if he would say this, but I, I'm going to kind of imply the idea that, well, perhaps our love of Arthur is a love of that uh, hero worship, of that charismatic leader that goes back into our ancient past. And we're pining after that within this bureaucratic system, this impersonal um, officialdom. We, we're missing that. And we ultimately, human beings are made for that kind of system. Uh, Rupert, would you add anything to that? No, I mean, I'm not... Um, well, I'm, I'm not as uh, acquainted with uh, Weber's thought as I would perhaps like to be, but based on the, uh, the outline that you gave, yeah, definitely very much more in the uh, charismatic camp, not least because he's also um, very personal. Hmm. That's possibly one place in which it, uh, the model itself sort of breaks down because um, obviously the realm doesn't purely consist of Arthur himself and his circle of knights, but those are the people who he is sort of connecting with more so. And so everyone beyond that is is somebody who has a in, in turn a kind of personal relationship with the various knights and the um, you know the, the notables who are ruling over them. And so in that sense, it's kind of uh, a bit more a bit more fractal. Mm. So he is Arthur is a charismatic figure, but he's not charismatic in the same way as like uh, you would associate the the charismatic figures of perhaps the nineteenth and twentieth century. He's not standing up and making huge uh, you know speech speeches to huge crowds. He's He's uh, operating much more interpersonally. Yes, I, th I think that's a good way of putting it. It's a, it's an intimate connection that he has with his knights, um, and and perhaps that's one of the the challenges with uh, societies of mass and scale is that actually you know our ancestors lived in small groups, uh, generally speaking. They weren't kind of massive. They knew everybody by name within their tribe or whatever. And even as you move forward, you would still know most of the people in your village or your town. And I imagine that's pretty much the same with like a monarch and most of the men that he's working with. Whereas today it's these massive institutions, which although your politician might try to be this charismatic leader, ultimately they are often subservient to the, the kind of civil servant class who operate on this, this uh, a priori basis because they're trying to administer to millions of people. Is it, do you think it's possible? Do you think that might, might be a challenge actually for an Arthurian uh, character moving forward is how do you translate that into, into a society of this size? I mean, possibly that is a reason that, well, one of the main things that was precluding the possibility of that kind of arrangement or that kind of return in, um, in the Victorian era, because the bureaucratic structures that had already started to take hold and, and we were already dealing with mass society by that point. So there were just, there wasn't really the, um, the air and space for an Arthur figure to kind of appear, the, the personal mm. connections that uh, an Arthur sort of both relies upon and also facilitates are not are not really the, the levels of power anymore. So maybe maybe the the, uh, the brittleness of the um, of the bureaucratic structures would have to sort of shatter it before there's any possibility of a, of a true restoration. Hmm. I, I and many years many years many months ago I did a stream. Um, I think it was like. Feudal, feudal mafioso in the zombie apocalypse, which sounds like the most convoluted, contrived stream ever. But essentially, I was trying to to make the argument that this kind of personal relationship that I think is a feature of uh, medieval Britain, 
the relationships between a lord and his man or his servant um that could reemerge within a an apocalyptic situation if you see something like the walking dead for example where society collapses the bureaucracy collapses it's no longer like these um officials who are able to administer society it's warrior men like rick grimes who through their courage through their strength organization draw people to them and become leaders which are loved and reviled by you know friends and enemies it's it so in a way those kinds of stories the the apocalyptic situations are almost i i hadn't kind of made this connection before but i almost wonder if they're like a quasi or arthurian in some sense because they they're they're almost allowing us to imagine okay from where we are today how could it be that we could exist with such uh men again well one thing i did just think actually is that um perhaps perhaps we're giving the bureaucracies and the administration too much credit um Mm. because much is made of the idea that the bureaucracies do not function how they claim to function it's not it's not a purely rigid uh procedural hierarchy and uh and pyramid which which can uh, seamlessly project the will of the higher down onto the lower there are many relationships relationships and uh and personal quirks that actually um interrupt the the mechanism to some degree so you could look at somebody like a uh i don't know it probably wouldn't wouldn't even necessarily need to be need to be a technical you know de jure leader but somebody who can actually work with people like heads of uh, heads of ngos like uh, members of the judiciary at the at the higher levels uh, members of the military members of the mafia and the criminal underworld and all these different groups who have their own sort of realms and their own power that they can project um but this person is working in uh, in such a a personal capacity but still able to utilize the power of all these different uh, you know all the, all these different groups and all these different interests so you know, perhaps some, perhaps someone you could say someone like a, I don't know, a Tony Blair or a uh, or a Biden who's able to lean on, uh, or a Clinton that's able to lean on all of these different interests and get get things like the media and the judiciary and the uh, the administration, like the civil service, to all kind of like work in their favor, despite them not necessarily being in the top job, is something like a uh, a feudal power, which is obviously mm. highly corrupted and used towards malicious ends rather than actually towards the better end of the realm almost like an anti-arthur an anti-arthur i like it yeah i think that's that's a good way of putting it i've i've often thought of um biden as a kind of uh prince john figure actually i think he uh, and maybe maybe all presidents to a certain degree but certainly biden is uh you know robbing robbing his own people essentially for his own gain and we've seen that with his own son recently as well um it's it's quite amazing the uh the the tyranny and corruption that's that uh is displayed in these characters you can definitely see the the parallels there he doesn't really do much but when he does it's uh it's to the detriment of the state either absent absent or more malignant (laughs) what a great president eh um (laughs) so um just in case there's any more questions i before bef- before we kind of wrap up but uh, and giving people time to ask to ask i i have a question for you rupert um which is in terms of like the people watching and most most of the people watching will be young men maybe around our age maybe slightly younger what what should should young men be doing at this moment because it's um you know it's these ideas are very important they're they're inspirational the things we can hope for we can strive for but it can be often uh a bit like okay what do i do with this kind of information uh, as as somebody who's maybe a bit cut off in my real life from other people who share that vision how do i translate that into something which isn't just a positive for me but positive to the community and hopefully to the nation, to the people. Um, what what would you say to that sort of individual, Rupert? 
who's watching just now. I think the uh, the ideal of the knight is is some, is one that's quite widely applicable, and so especially in terms of the Arthurian knight, someone who is um, fully embracing of the the ideals of the knight and the and chivalric virtues uncritically, and uh, somebody who can do so very earnestly and without without a sense of like uh, cynicism or or alternate purpose. Perhaps that's one of the difficult things is um, kind of trying to find a uh, a reason to sort of fulfill this archetype, to, thinking that it might it, that it will lead you somewhere, or doing doing it because it will lead you somewhere. But it's it sort of requires a an adherence to the to the virtue itself because that's kind of where the greatness comes from. So mm. embracing this archetype, striving for um, some kind of uh, some kind of questing, like some some kind of quest. Um, and some kind of uh, ideal that will be a, a sort of a guiding and, and focusing objective, both perhaps for some kind of higher purpose and and uh, even for some kind of um, you know more more direct imperative. You know, perhaps by a uh, if, if you know if there is some kind of like lord figure, then um, you know respecting that fact and look, and if if it is if it doesn't exist, then looking looking for one and. Uh, in turn, perhaps looking for people who you would be able to either work alongside or or above, and try to sort of like find that aristocratic place in the uh, in the hierarchy. There's probably an Arthur out there somewhere, and so sort of being ready to being ready to embrace him when he when he appears. Hmm. But but more than anything, just kind of um, trying to re-embrace the chivalric virtues, and uh, in some ways living like William Marshall. And believing in the uh, believing in and standing by the the virtues, even when it sort of seems like it, it's in your sort of rational interest to to work against them, because there's a there's an there's an inherent aesthetic and uh, and moral value in adhering to the knightly standard. I remember you speaking about that when we we uh, discussed Saint George. Actually, was that um the you know he goes to battle with the dragon and it's not for financial gain it's not for securing a kingdom and it's at great risk to his own life but he does it because it's the right thing to do he's there he's in that place there's a innocent woman about to be devoured by a dragon he's just going to go and fight it because that's there's no other there's nothing more to to say than it's the right thing and even if he loses his life, he'd rather do that than than not intervene, um, because that is the virtuous path of the knight. So that's the kind of sincerity that you were you've been trying to to, to emphasize to us, Rupert. Uh, that sincerity in the belief in that ideal um, above above all other things. And in a way, as you said, that is where that greatness comes from. That's Carlyle's great man has that attribute to it. It's almost his defining attribute, actually. Yeah, and, and I mean, I guess to to bring out the like some of the other some of the other themes from uh, from previous episodes, making some room for uh, for merriment and uh, you know embracing embracing the um, the merry England value of uh, of sort of like leisure and, uh, and and letting loose a little bit and making making time for for earnest, earnest fun. Um, embracing, embracing your role as a uh, as a custodian and, and, and like a good uh, a good lord and master, like um, like a George Cadbury, perhaps. Especially if if you're if you're in that kind of uh, good position to be able to um, be a patron, doing so very honourably and uh, and with you know charity and magnanimity, mm -hmm. um, pursuing justice even when there's no immediate reward, and and even perhaps if that would. Uh, Make you an enemy of of temporary legal, um, you know, le legal structures. Do what you can to pursue justice, like Robin Hood. Do your duty, like uh, like Saint George. Regardless of again whether whether it will uh, give you any immediate uh, reward for doing so, regardless of what you're promised, do it because it's your duty. I, th I think also as well, because I, I think those are like underlying principles. 
But I, I, I would also encourage the young men uh, listening to this and others, but you know, most of the audience will be young men, is to think about um, your role as well. What strengths do you have? What um, passions do you have? And how those can be suited to those virtues. So for example, if you have a talent for organization, well, actually one of the things that we need more of is organizers within uh, our sphere. We have lots of talented influencers. We could always do with more, but actually they need kind of technical support behind the scenes. So if you have that skill, okay, you might not get the glory up front, but hey, you doing your part is actually a massive thing and uh, helps to fulfill those those virtues that uh, Rupert was outlining. Another example would be art. Perhaps it's, uh, you know, um, you're, a, you're a writer or a musician or a, a painter of some kind. Actually, that has a role too. It's not, it's, it, it's easy to think, oh, well, we're talking about Robin Hood, St. George, therefore you have to be like a warrior. No, actually, you can have those virtues and manifest them in different fields, all for the betterment of the community. So I think, I think that's, um, don't feel, oh, I have to become a knight in the the literal sense as opposed to the 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 principle of the night within that field that you're in w would you agree with that rupert uh not necessarily because the troubadours okay. were knights okay okay well so if you have an artistic yeah. uh if you have an artistic pursuit that does not preclude you from uh from embodying other knightly virtues Yes. Well, okay then. I, I, I'll 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 row back on 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 that on how I formalized it. But I guess I guess I, I'm I'm trying to say like um, you can have there's different forms of it then different forms of knighthood. Yeah. There's not kind of one path with that. Well, I mean that there are certain underlying things. Um, mm -hmm. As somebody, uh, yeah, as Right Honourable Fez uh, said in the chat, um, a, a knight first and foremost is, uh, is a fighter. And so, uh, being able to cultivate martial virtues is is in itself something that the knight should be pursuing. Mm. That's true. But it, it, I mean, you're, you're, but, but you're right that uh, just kind of keeping an open mind and and to some extent letting providence guide your path will probably be uh, will probably be good. There will there will be things that will be put in your path, and uh, and the the correct thing to do will probably seem like the correct thing to do. I guess, I guess there's a there's a there's a good point there though in terms of um, cultivating body, mind, and spirit. Would that would that be a fair kind of summation? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I th I think that's um, a good place to kind of bring it to a close. Um, you know, that's a good message for people to to take away with them. Thank you so much, Rupert. Uh, not only for tonight, um, but for all of your contributions throughout the last year i guess or the best part of the year uh, i've really appreciated working with you it's been great fun i've learned so much and uh you know i've made a friend along the way so i'm very grateful to you rupert for um being a part of this and i i'm, I'm sure we'll be in touch but i wish you every success uh with your own channel uh moving forward too and all your endeavors thank you very much um uh, the sentiment is is entirely mutual and uh I look forward to hopefully hearing about your uh, your path to heroism. <laughs> me too, me too. I, I shall let you know when I when I know Rupert. <laughs> um, and thank you all in the in the who have been viewing as well, and those in the chat. I'm very grateful that you've been tuning in over the year. It has been it's, it's been an absolute joy getting to know many of you, discussing things with you. Um, being able to share what I'm interested about with just intelligent, um, spirited, and people who get it, people who get it. And I wish you all so, I wish you all, I wish that God blesses you all and that you have er much fruit in your future, not only for yourselves, but for your family, for your kin, for your people. In the meantime, I'm going to sign off with a little thing I put together. I think it's appropriate for this channel. And um, maybe one day I'll return, maybe not. But whatever happens, God bless you all.
Good night, my friends. Good night. I, uh... I have things to do. I put this off for far too long. I regret to announce this is the end. I'm going now. I bid you all a very fond farewell. Goodbye. Oh!